uh, safe travels to those who are, uh, had to leave early. Um, welcome everyone. We're gonna get started with the closing session of Code for Lib 2018. Sadly, it has to end. I know, I know. So, okay. So as I scroll up the announcements list, uh, first off, starting off, we're gonna talk about duty officers. Galen and Christy are in the back. They are our duty officers for today. Yep, thank you Galen for waving. Um, everyone, please return your lanyards and badge holders to the registration desk so we can reuse it for the next conference. So if you're heading out, have to head out early to catch that flight, please stop by the registration desk and give us back the lanyard and badge holder. Um, let's see, also uh, rolling announcements, as always, be kind to the Wi-Fi. Please don't stream the conference from within the room. Keep uh, the number of item, or the number of devices connected to the Wi-Fi at a minimum. Uh, code for lib, the Wi-Fi is code for lib. Password is code for lib 2018. Um, let's see, uh, today we're gonna be, uh, after our keynote speaker, we're gonna be having lightning talks after that and then our uh, planned presentation. So lightning, uh, lightning talk speakers, please get ready to transfer your slides if you need them for your lightning talk. Um, please note how I am leaning into the mic. Uh, we ask that pre presenters and question askers uh, speak into the microphone to include everyone, including speakers, attendees, live streamers, and, live and the live transcription service can hear what is being said. Hi, Mom. Um, and so, uh, MCs, oh, that's me. I'm gonna make sure that I help you with the microphone before uh, you get started with your presentation. So, uh, if you have any accessibility need, you need the link to the live transcription, uh, uh, how to use a microphone, all that and more is available on the accessibility page on the conference website. Um, I don't think we have any existing or ongoing lost and found items. If not, I'll update you, don't worry. Um, and as always, um, please don't hack the internet because the Secret Service will show up. Y'all have heard this before. So, um, uh, now at this point, I am going to invite Bethany and Peggy to come up to the stage. Uh, they have some important things to discuss with you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we're here this morning on behalf of the duty officers and the LPC to address two separate incidents. First, duty officers received a number of reports regarding an offensive comment made during a presentation yesterday afternoon. This comment was in violation of the Code for Lib Code of Conduct. Following our process, the duty officer sought immediate contact and discussion with the speaker. The speaker, who was unable to attend the conference today, has requested that we relay to you the following message. And I quote, this was one of those moments where as soon as the word came out of my mouth, I regretted it. Please express my sincere apologies to the Code for Lib community. We are addressing the community as a whole to share this resolution and to emphasize that the Code of Conduct is an attempt to ensure a safe and welcoming environment for all members of the community. Offensive expressions related to race do not constitute a welcoming environment. Code for Lib provides an opportunity for many people to address a large group, and as we all know, words matter. While all conference attendees should be mindful of the impact of their words, that responsibility particularly adheres to speakers. So, all right, shift gears. In a step, no, it's still us. In a separate incident yesterday, duty officers received a report of a pattern of unwanted social contact constituting harassment and also in violation of the conference code of conduct. The situation is likewise being handled according to 
established procedures and with uh, utmost respect for the anonymity and the safety of the reporter. As part of our response to this report, the duty officers have decided to address the community as a whole, and that's why I'm still standing up here. The message is this, respect boundaries. If someone has asked you to desist from future contact, either recently or at any point in the past, please do everything in your power to avoid being physically near that person and cease engaging with them online. Duty officers are present to provide support for anyone who has been harassed or threatened or who feels the code of conduct has been violated during the conference. You can contact officers in person, via phone, text, or email, via the duty officers command in Slack, and through an anonymous web form, all available under the conduct and safety link on the website. So we would ask that all attendees take some time to refresh their memories of the code of conduct. And I come to the end here. The LPC and officers want to affirm that Code for Lib should be a space in which respect for others governs our professional and social interactions. So thank you all uh, for listening and to all of us here for reflecting on our own personal interactions in the context of this second report. Thank you, Bethany. Thank you, Peggy. Um, moving forward, it is my honor to introduce our closing keynote speaker, speaker um, Mega Subramaniam, uh, is the Associate Professor at the College of Information Studies at the University of Maryland. Mega's research focuses on enhancing the role of libraries in fostering the mastery of emerging digital literacies that are essential for STEM learning among underserved young people. Mega is the lead PI for the IMLS-funded Graduate Certificate of Professional Studies and Youth Experience, uh, co-leads two other IMLS-funded projects, uh, Connected Lib and Safe Data, Safe Families, all intended to bring research and practice together to enhance the skills of in-service and pre-service youth librarians. Her first access to, to a computer was when she was in college and she learned to code from a friend. When she formally took her first coding course in college, her professor specifically said to her that she would never be good at it. She is determined to bring the experience and joy of coding to underserved youth across the world. Mega currently serves as a fellow for the Libraries Ready to Code project led by the Office for Information Technology Policy at the American Library Associ Association. So everyone, please put your hands together for Mega. Good morning, everyone. So it's really nice to see most of the crowd that I saw on Monday. I don't think the crowd actually lessened. Um, I know it's tough being on Friday and the last day of the conference, and today is the opening day, well, kind of the opening day for Black Panther. So I know a lot of you probably will be heading there after this, right? Um, me and my kids, that's our Friday night plan today. So I'm really looking forward to that. I'm also really looking forward to um, speaking with all of you, uh, engaging with you today. So um, it's, it's always kind of awkward to hear people introduce uh, me when I'm actually right in front there. Uh, but thank you so much, Mary, for the lovely introduction. Thank you to the Code for Lib Committee uh, for inviting me for the conference. Um, and those of you who thought that I'll have good things to say today, so hopefully it will be beneficial to all of you. I want to do a special shout out uh, to uh, University of Maryland's alumni, Jamie Mears, uh, who uh, actually did a lot of things at the event today. So I'm really, really proud of Jamie. Thank you, Jamie, for doing this. Um, 
and I'm actually recovering from a cold, so I apologize for my voice. It might just crack at one point, and I know it's probably not so painful for people who are listening here, but people who are listening with their headphones at wherever they are, that might be a little bit more painful. Um, so I do have a confession to make before I get started. Um, I was actually very perplexed that I was asked uh, to talk about whatever uh, in this keynote, right? Um, so typically when I give keynotes, um, the organizers give me a topic, uh, give me strict dimensions on what I can talk about. Sometimes I feel like they're telling me what to say, um, but here I had this flexibility of talking about whatever that I want. So I hope Code for Lip community will continue to do that because I think that's really great. Um, so I am going to take that opportunity uh, to talk about whatever that I want today and also to engage um, all of you to help with some of the larger initiatives with underserved youth that I'm working on. So while you're all here to hear me talk, I'm more interested to see um, how all of you can help. So I'll tell you a little bit as we go on. So today, I'm gonna to talk about uh, libraries as a player in computational thinking and why should we care? Why should libraries care about computational thinking? So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself the type of work that I do, and then we'll proceed to the actual um, talk for today. And I always think it's good to know about the speaker before you hear about things that I want to tell you about. So I teach in the Masters of Library and Information Science program, uh, specifically in the Youth Experience Specialization uh, that I helped develop, uh, the Diversity and Inclusion Specialization that I also helped develop, and the School Library speciali Specialization and also courses in our PhD program. So my broad research agenda is to investigate how underserved and disadvantaged young adults use libraries for the development of digital literacy skills essential for STEM learning, and also how libraries can actually play a role in developing and sustaining young adults' interests in STEM. So the young adults that I work mostly are middle school and high school kids. Um, but in recent years, I've broadened that, uh, the interest, my research to define youth from birth to 18. Because I really think a lot of work that we do in terms of developing digital literacy need to start much, much earlier. So to achieve this broad research agenda, I have two threats. One is I work directly with young adults um, to leverage the strengths in the library by creating learning environments that help them develop digital literacy skills and also increase their STEM interests. So for example, just a couple of blocks away from here, I worked with a few schools, um, school libraries in the DC public school system where we leverage um, the interests that youth have in science fiction and science-infused media. In fact, when I started uh, that program was when the first Marvel movie came out. Um, so we leveraged that interest and also librarians' knowledge about fiction and movies. And then we encouraged youth to produce science stories on their own uh, using various formats. This really, really built their interest uh, in terms of STEM. The second thread of my research is that I work directly with librarians to enhance their skills and abilities to facilitate digital literacy and also inspire STEM among the youth that they work with. So essentially in the second thread, I bring research and practice together uh, to enhance the skills of the librarians. And I, I work with both pre-service librarian and also in-service librarians, so librarians who are practicing. So for example, the Graduate Certificate of Youth Experience, which, is, which was funded uh, by Institute of Museum and Library Services that I co-developed with my colleagues at Maryland, we train librarians to facilitate such learning, the learning that I talked about. We also engage youth uh, to be speakers, to be designers of the program, so that librarians don't actually make up all these programs, but engage youth to co-design those programs with them. I also started bringing developments from learning sciences, youth development, human-computer interaction, 
and we brought all those developments on how they work with teens to get feedback on technology that they design, we brought them into librarianship. So in alignment with the second thread today, uh, I'm going to talk about the Libraries Ready to Code project. So I'll begin with the, um, um, with the state of the information sector, which was recently produced by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And then I'm gonna move on to things that I would love to chat with the Code for Lib community, which is computational thinking. So I'll give you the definition, which I would say this is a definition from a uh, definition that I have been using. There's a lot of definitions that are out there and that definition is still evolving. And then I'm gonna share with you three examples of what libraries are doing. This is from the project libraries are ready to code. And then I will also share with you why I think libraries could be a player and should be a player in computational thinking, especially in young adults. And then I'll also share with you where librarians, youth librarians need help, and that is where I think all of you can play a role. Um, so hopefully we'll have some time to do some Q&A, but mostly during the Q&A time, I want to know uh, how all of you can help. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so I know you can't really see that, but the new employment projections data, now you can probably see, I highlighted some stuff. So the new employment projection data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics for 2016 to 2026, that just came out a couple of months ago, I think in October. So this, uh, this report actually highlighted that the information sector, so the, in the sector that most of us are in, is projected to have five of the 20 industries with the fastest growing input, output. Three of which are the fastest growing real output industries in the economy and they are all information related. Increased use of mobile devices, addition of software to basically everything that we use from car to dishwashers, um, will actually create demand for application um, for software developers. And then as more devices are connected to the internet, the need to combat cybersecurity threats will also increase. So, so in the next 10 years, half of all new STEM jobs that are going to be created are all going to be computing. But wait, this is really not surprising, right? For us, right? We've been hearing this for a long time. And um, what is interesting is this computational plus X, as people call it, is, influ is influencing research and practices in nearly all disciplines. So in the sciences, in the social sciences, in the humanities, computational thinking is transforming biology, computational thinking is transforming archival science, computational thinking is transforming neuroscience, microeconomics, and also the humanities. So really, this is not new news for us, right? So the term computational thinking came uh, way before 2006. I know that you see the definition on the slide, the first definition that I put there is in 2006, right? But even before that, we've heard about computational thinking. So this is not a new term. But Janet Wing, who's a professor, who was a professor at Carnegie Mellon University, now I believe she works for Microsoft Research. She's the one that popularized this term, computational thinking. So she says that computational thinking includes a range of mental tools that reflect the breadth of the field of computer science. Computational thinking is a fundamental skill for everyone, not just computer scientists, right? So it was interesting because she wrote this article in 2006, and I can tweet out this article later, um, she wrote this article when most computer science departments were actually closing shop. So this is when she came up with this, saying that, hey, computer science is important, but not just for people who are thinking of majoring in computer science. Com computational thinking is fundamental skill for everyone. So, but she really didn't define what computational thinking is in her first article in 2006. But in 2010, 
uh, she attempted to define it. So, which is the thought process involved in formulating problems and their solutions so that the solutions are represented in a form that can be effectively be carried out by an information processing agent. So she did define it the second time. And I would say when she started talking about it in 2006, that's when the whole computational thinking term became really popular. So um, computational thinking, she says in her 2010 article, is a new literacy for the 21st century. Um, so she says that if someone has computational thinking skills, they are able to understand what aspects of a problem are amenable to computation. They are able to understand and able to evaluate the match between computational tools and techniques and a problem. They are also able to understand the limitations and power of computational tools and techniques. So Janet Wing actually breaks this down to five mental processes. And I know that some of you may already know this, but I like us to get started with a working definition that all of us can use. So the first mental skill that she talks about is decomposition. So when one is faced with a problem, you can break it down to smaller, more manageable parts. That's decomposition. Decompos Pattern recognition needs to be when they look at those parts and, and can see if there are commonalities so that solving one part can actually solve a number of parts. Abstraction, abstraction is when they are able to focus on things that are important and not pay attention or become overwhelmed by the details of the data that they are getting. Algorithm, so algorithm is being used very, very, um, uh, broadly these days, right? Uh, you see the, you hear the word algorithm, and I, in fact, I think among all this um, computational thinking, mental skills, algorithm is probably the one that's most talked about. So algorithm is an abstraction of a process that takes that input, executes a sequence of steps, and then produces an output to satisfy a desired goal. Automation is another word that has been used a lot, and sometimes kind of out of context. Uh, automation could be how other people can enact the solution without the person who actually made it being there since they've already la elegantly laid out the step-by-step -step clear algorithm they may, that may work here or make, may work at another context or at another time. So we now have a working definition for computational thinking. So let's look at the library's ready to code project. So um, there is so much growing interest in computational thinking that libraries now have been tapped to facilitate computational thinking and coding program. So just this October past year in 2017, the American Library Association's uh, Office for Information Technology Policy, which has an office here in DC, uh, with the support from Google, they gave out half a million dollars grant uh, to 28 libraries across 21 states plus the District of Columbia to design and implement coding and computational thinking programs for young people. So this, this project is still uh, ongoing. And as you can see, right, you can see from the map where these libraries are distributed, and you can see there's a gap there in the middle, and I hope some of you are from those states in the middle, because you, know, you can definitely help out to, for us to get um, people going there with computational thinking and coding uh, programs. So this grant uh, was this part of this huge initiative called Libraries Ready to Code. Um, and this is the first time, I believe, that ALA has dedicated funding uh, in such a large scale for computational thinking and coding programs in libraries. So uh, I'd like to show you some examples of what these libraries are doing and I'm gonna share with you three examples today. And they have different flavors, different strengths. They also focus on different age groups between that zero to 18. So one will be for younger children, one will be more towards the tween age, so nine, 10, 11, 12, and one will be for teens. And 
start looking at how computational thinking is in action there. So this first uh, program uh, is from DC public libraries. Do we have any DCPL librarians here? I just see one hand there. Okay, so um, I actually was able to observe this program. This is called Ready, Set, Think uh, for pre-K to second graders and also their families. So uh, parents come along and participate in this program. So this um, whole session runs for an hour in the evening. I think it's right after school. Um, so you can see that they have four rotating stations there. So the librarian sets up four rotating stations. And this is completely unplugged, right? There's no computers. They're trying to learn that four, first, the four mental skills of computational thinking. They didn't really do automation, but they just did the four. So as you can see, for decomposition, uh, the kids are trying to uh, tie sh a shoelace, uh, but they are not doing it. They work with a group of kids. Uh, one of them will be giving instruction to the other on to tie the shoelace. So essentially breaking a huge problem, which is tying a shoelace into smaller parts, right? And you may think that's easy, but when you're telling someone else to tie their shoelace, it's not really easy. And the kids get frustrated, uh, and you know, sometimes there has to be some anger intervention that needs to come place between the librarian and the child. Um, so it was really fascinating to see the kids uh, trying to tie the shoelace. And in fact, I might tie my shoelace very differently than you do, right? You have different styles, right? Um, so this is an unplugged way of teaching decomposition. And then pattern recognition, I think the picture kind of tells you what pattern recognition is. Uh, and then abstraction is another place that I thought was pretty challenging for the kids. So um, what the librarian did is that she gave, um, uh, they all take turns in a group. So one person will get uh, a stack of cards and they choose one card from there. And the card has uh, a word, uh, a word of an object. So it could be a rainbow, it could be a tiger, it could be a cat. Uh, I heard the cat references is very popular uh, in, on, among all of you, so I had to use that. Um, so then this child that gets the cut has to draw the object, right? But abstraction is that you need to remove all the things that are not important, but focus on the things that are important. So when they're drawing, they need to figure out how can they draw so that the person can, who is watching them draw can actually guess the picture uh, as soon as possible, right? So they need to think a little bit. And there was a lot of frustration there too, but once they got it, I think it went really well. So for example, when you're drawing the rainbow, they just started drawing like this and the people guessed it, right? You don't actually have to like start coloring it or anything. So um, it was really, really fascinating to see these kids working. Algorithm design uh, is basically um, creating instructions to move objects around a board. As you can see, they built like an obstacle clause and they needed to create instructions so that another person can execute that instruction. So that's a program, computational thinking, still running uh, for younger kids and their families. Uh, before, the par uh, before the kids go home, the librarian actually has a packet of all these activities except for the Legos. I don't think she was giving out the Legos, but otherwise, you know, everything else is there. They can do this at home. So let me describe a little bit about the demographics of this population that is participating in this program. And I got the information about the demographics primarily from the librarian. I just asked her. Um, and that's because some of these are kind of hard to get data, data that's hard to get. For example, socioeconomic status is not just income, right? That's educational background, that's other things that need to come together to evaluate social, socioeconomic status. So I just asked the librarian uh, about all this. Um, so you can see the map of DC there. It's offered in four branches, uh, Petworth Library, Woodbridge, Francis Gregory, and Capital View. In terms of demographics, the indicator that you see in the bottom for each, technology access at home, socioeconomic status, technology expertise that's needed on the librarian to um, offer the program, and partnership availability. So you'll just see icons on top there, 
right? I'm just going to explain this once so that the next time we see this again for the other libraries, it all makes sense. Um, so if you just see one icon, that means it's in the low side. If you see two, for example, the partnership availability here, you see two, it's moderate, and then three is like, it's high. So in terms of access to technology, um, the librarian said that although these kids have technology access at home, it's mostly um, on their phone and all using their parents' phone, right? So having a phone doesn't really allow you to do a lot of things on it, right? It's pretty restricted. And from my experience working with DC public school kids, a lot of them have shared computers at home. So um, a whole family will share a computer. Uh, one time I was talking to a middle school kid as part of the program that I was running, and he was saying that he never gets to use the computer at home because his grandmother was always on Facebook on the computer. So, right, so he was super frustrated. But you, you can see the struggle that the kids have, right, when you have only one computer at home. So I categorized that at low access, uh, low access to technology at, at home. Socioeconomic status, all these four branches except for one branch, has very low percentage of people who have college degrees. degrees. It ranges from 13, 1.3, to 32%. So it's very low. And in 2016, uh, there was a report that came out um, that was produced by the library. 46% of children living east of the Washington, D.C.'s Anacostia River live at or below poverty levels. In terms of technology expertise that's needed for the librarian to run that program that I just described to you, basically none, right? No technology expertise needed, except for the understanding of what computational thinking is. Partnership availability is medium, I would say, because uh, the librarian said that in order for her to run this program to get people to come, she reached out to DC public schools. They actually have a very good relationship with the school system. Um, and they recruited the parents to come, the kids to come, and also through the homeschool networks. So that's the first program. So now, I'm going to take you to Homer, Alaska. Anyone here from Alaska? No, I thought so. Um, so this program is called Maker to Mentors. This is offered at Homer Public Library in Alaska. And I'll give you a little bit of demographics of this community, but let me tell you a little bit about this program. So these are middle school students, uh, 11 to 13 years old. They learn how to code at a weekly program. So the program runs for seven sessions, and there is, there is four sessions after that for them to do the mini design challenge ideas that you see on the slide. So the first seven session introduces them to key computer science concepts like functions, variables, loops, conditions, and all that. And then they have four sessions which is dedicated for them to use what they have learned to complete this design challenge where they actually not just use the coding skills that they have but also computational thinking skills. So the mini design challenge is um, you know, all the prompts that you see on the, bar, uh, on, the, on the slide, and such as creating an animated music video, 2D flying game, uh, choose your, you know, do, do an animated PSA and all that. Uh, and I think they use Scratch in order to do this. So um, Scratch is a block-based programming language, so it's easy to use, uh, and they have a lot of fun. Let me tell you a little bit about the, uh, about Homer. So you can see where the Homer Public Library is from the map. The librarian who is running this program is the only youth librarian. She doesn't have staff. She's the only person. Homer is about 218 miles southwest of Anchorage. And about the Homer Public Library is about 25 miles away from the city of Homer. And this obviously is a rural area. Um, so I asked the librarian about technology access and all the questions that I asked the DC public librarian as well. 
She said that about 50% have internet access outside of the school. In terms of socioeconomic status, a bit better than what I told you about DC, but at least 50% of the kids require qualify, uh, so, sorry, they qualify for free and reduced meals at schools. However, cost of living at Homer is very, very high. So many youth cannot really have uh, go to after-school programs unless it's offered through the library. The technology expertise that's needed from the librarian to run this program, I would consider this moderate because she does need to know how to code uh, and um, definitely needs more technology expertise than the unplugged activity that I showed you earlier for the DC public um, library system. Partnership availability, this is where it gets really, really depressing. Um, she says that as far as she knows, there are no computer scientists at, in the, near close to the city where the library is located. Maybe there are some people who are engineers, right? Uh, but no computer scientists. Um, no computer science schools offered in high schools in the neighborhood. So basically, these kids are deprived from computer science. So what she did, uh, which I thought was really, really good, is that she tracked down uh, computer scientists who are successful, uh, and um, she and th these are people who are Alaskan born. So she was able to bring in uh, the creator of a shopping network called Dot D O T E. Uh, she was Alaska born, so she, ca she came through Skype virtually and talked to the kids how she um, got to where she is from. And she said that was really, really aspiring to the kids. Um, so this is how um, this community really takes whatever that they have and makes the best of it. Mm, the last program that I want to share with you today is this program offered um, in Seattle Public Library. Do we have anyone from Seattle Public Library here? Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> so uh, this is also another fascinating program. This is called Build a Computer and Beat the Clock Program. This program is inspired by the slowest computer in the Earth emulator. Has anyone heard about that? Oh, you have to look it up. Look up slowest computer in the earth and you will find that screen that, I sh that is on your lower left. Right. Um, this is a um, program that's designed by two game designers, Kaho Abe and Ramsey Nasser. And I think they're based somewhere in New York. This is a computational thinking heavy program, but without using any computers at all. It's perfect for the teens. So in this program, they build and program the slowest computer in the world using sponges. As you can see, all the yellow stuff on the slide are sponges. They use post-its, they use markers, and they use tapes. So the, the teens are actually given a set of instructions on how to order the sponges. They order the sponges 10 by 10. The librarian had a great time going to the grocery store and buying all the sponges. He tweeted all the pictures. Um, so he, they will arrange it 10 by 10 with the yellow facing up. And then they build the axis on two sides with a tape making the shape of L. And then they write zero to nine on the masking tape for both the column and the rows. Uh, and then just underneath there, they arrange 16 post-it notes in two rows of eight and they label it from A through P. So the grid of the sponges is actually the screen of a computer, and every sponge is a pixel. So the pixels will be turned off when it's yellow, it will be turned on when it's green. So post-it notes that are arranged right under the sponge, um, they, are, they are the memory and each post-it notes is a cell within the memory. So then, what they, once they're done with all that, they get a set of instructions, right? Um, without knowing what the picture that's going to produce. So essentially what you have to do is follow that instructions and, all, and certain, certain sponges will be flipped, right? 
right? So then you'll see a picture. There you see a smiley face picture, right? So they have to follow an instructions, but they will not know what is the picture until they are done with it. And it's a competition. They have small groups who can do it fast. So the instruction will be like plot, which means you have to flip the sponge. You have to, they have set, which means you have to write a value for memory cell. The seven pieces of instruction. I can give you the whole lesson plan if you're interested in this. But this is something that is being offered at the Seattle Public Library System. So it's offered at the Douglas Drew, Rainier Beach, South Park, and Beacon Hill uh, libraries. Um, and what was interesting is that uh, when I talked to this, the digital services uh, manager who actually had uh, connections with the game designers, the two game designers that came up with this game, um, he said that um, although Seattle is located in a, in a place where there's a lot of uh, computing industries, it's really interesting because the population, the kids that come to the library are kids who only have access to technology using their cell phone. And said so most of them don't really have access to computers at home. Again, we're talking about the same thing that I just said. Socioeconomic status is also pretty low with many recent immigrant communities. Um, and technology expertise that's needed for the librarian is, I think it's somewhere between the DC one and the Homer one, right? Because you need a little bit more understanding on how you can, how the actual, uh, actual game transfers into computational thinking. So uh, the two game designers actually came to Seattle and they trained their librarians to do this. Uh, what was really fascinating is that uh, not only the librarians participated in this training, there were a few youth that they tapped uh, through their partnership with Park and Rec uh, and also Boys and Girls Club to come in and go through the training with them. So then when the actual program was run, the youth are the ones that were running it. The librarians were just supporting the programs. And believe it or not, the kids um, had more fun and they learned from each other as they were doing this. All right. So why libraries for the development of computational thinking? Now that I've showed you three examples, And I think I'm running out of time. Okay, so the first reason is libraries increasingly are embracing the connected learning approach to offer programming to youth. What is this connected learning approach? So all the programs that I had showed to you earlier, the three learning principles that is tied into all these three is they are interest driven. We are tapping the things that the kids are doing already, the things that they are interested in, everyday life things, and bringing them as a program to facilitate computational thinking. They are peer supported, meaning the kids are learning from each other, learning from their peers. The, the librarians and the adult mentors are there to support them. And they are academically oriented. That means it bridges formal learning and informal learning, but really they don't really see it. It actually bridges that. Right. So um, since the mental tools that are best learned, uh, the mental tools that I'm referring to is the computational thinking mental tools, these are best learned through the development of dispositions such as collaboration, persistence, resilience. Libraries actually have the ability to provide youth with a range of mental tools that I just explained just now. And in an informal setting, without the pressure of being graded, and it's okay to do it wrong, to do it again and again and again. And to do it in a group and trying to figure that out, that's even, even more powerful. I thought um, this, I like this image a lot. Um, so library programming actually allows learning and not necessarily focused on teaching. We are not teaching the kids, but they are we are facilitating the learning. So for me, computational thinking is not something that can be taught. Rather, it is learned through how generally young people learn. 
They learn by observing. They learn by imitating. They learn from their friends. And they follow trends. Another powerful uh, way that libraries play a, play a role is computational thinking can be learned even by the youngest person. I have librarians as part of the library ready, ready to code who are using story time to embed computational thinking. So meaning computational thinking can be developed in children in young age, even before they kind of, they learn any type of com computer science in formal classrooms. By doing computational thinking in libraries, we can demonstrate relevance of the CS plus X that I started up in the beginning. In fact, librarians mostly have that background in X, right? So it, it, it could be humanities, it could be any social sciences. And the partners that we have within our communities is also the X. So connections are more clearer when the librarians make that connection between CS plus X. And I put this the last, the clear one why libraries for the development of computational thinking is libraries provide physical, intellectual, and social access to computational thinking and coding that youth currently don't get at home. And I put this the last because this is where librarians always speak up first. They always say we provide access, but all the other things that I mentioned, they completely you know, kind of not say that uh, whenever I ask them, but that also happens. And that's why I think libraries are more powerful in terms of facilitating development of computational thinking. So code for lib community. This is where I want to engage you because all of you have that computational thinking skills and have the computer science skills, coding skills. Many of you do. So this is where you can help. And this is where I see there is a need with the public and school librarians that I work with. What computational thinking concepts should be facilitated and when? You know, when I was talking to you about the DC, um, uh, the ready, set, think, the stations. So I asked my, uh, the librarian, she's actually a student in my program. I asked her, how did she come up with it? She said she Googled it, she tried to find it, she couldn't find anything for that age. So she started thinking about it and started coming up with, with coming out about it uh, with her classmates. She was talking to them and figuring it out. It's sometimes really hard to figure out this type of activities without someone to talk to, right? Someone who has that knowledge on computational thinking. And I think this is where that all of you can, can be helpful. So um, when do we do this? Are there specific things that we can do with younger children? Are there specific things that we can do better with the teens? How to facilitate? This is also an, uh, an interesting question. What prompt should we, be, should we be giving to kids so that they can recognize the pattern? Uh, when to prompt it, right? Because when, you, when you're tying the shoelace, right, you're using the loops, right? So you have to prompt them with specific questions so they are, it registers to them that they are actually using computer science concepts there. So facilitations needs to foster computational thinking concepts, computational practices, uh, and how can librarians be more comfortable facilitating this, especially with concepts that they're not really comfortable with. How do you find technology experts to help? Um, so this is where I think all of you come in. Uh, there are some times when youth librarians really need an expert and they really want to do the program, but they don't have the expertise, so they don't. How to assess learning of computational thinking in libraries? What instruments can be used? Can the learning be assessed by the artifact that they produce? Right? How do we do that? So these are the areas that I believe the Code for Lib community can help with. And so please reach out. Please reach out. Either you can reach out to me or reach out to the um, school or public librarians that are in your community. When I showed you the... Uh, the places earlier, I will put the slides after this. I just didn't want to, I want to be a little bit more, uh, I guess I want to keep the suspense. So I just did not put my slides before. So with that, I want to thank the Libraries Ready to Code team, uh, Marika Visser, Linda Brown, and Caitlin Martin for helping me out with this presentation. 
Uh, a lot of these ideas came from all the, t uh, all the team members. I want to give a shout out to these three libra uh, librarians who are doing amazing work, DCPL, Paula Langsam, Homer Public Library, Claudia Haynes, uh, Seattle Public Library, Juan Rubio, uh, and then Christy Kodama, who helped me with this uh, presentation. Thank you, everyone. I think we have five minutes for questions. I'm sorry. Please come and see me after this. Any questions? Everyone is really tired. <laughs> I just wanted to, first of all, thank you for um, really concentrating on how to think about computer problems. I was fortunate enough that the first book I read in, in computer science class was one called, <coughs> excuse me, How to Solve It, which goes over a lot of those kinds of things. It's uh, actually written by a math professor, um, but it has, how do you solve logical problems? And it was actually the most useful things because I often work with students um, who can code, but they can't think about how do you solve a bigger problem. And these kinds of skills are just, you know, really fabulous. So thank you very much for looking at the low level things and trying to bring kids in. Thank you. I just wanted to comment that um, I don't know if you uh, if um, you are aware of this, but uh, the high school course, AP Computer Science, did anyone take that course when they were in high school? Yeah. So um, I have no comments about the course. Um, but now they have AP Computing Principles, which actually breaks down all these principles. I think this was maybe just two years ago they started it. Thank you for the comment. Um, so I'm a community college librarian. And I'm wondering about how we can teach these skills to our adult learners, okay. who, many of whom in our community, um, where the logging industry went bad, fishing industry, all of these people making the transition, and they're adults who don't have computational thinking. So thoughts about how we can help that with, with our adult learners? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's pretty similar in terms of approach, right? But then again, you also, um, so I teach mostly adults, right? Because uh, I am a, um, I teach in the graduate program. Um, so the approach, you also have to appreciate people's ego when they're coming to this to this uh, programs, right? So one of the ways that you can think about this is um, to ask them to learn from, um, so let me phrase this um, much better. So one of the uh, strategies that really help is this intergenerational learning, and especially when the child or uh, the younger person that's teaching is the person that's closest to you, that comes from your community, or you know, it's your child or your grandchild, right? So the intergenerational learning is really, really powerful. That's one thing to consider. Uh, the other thing is because they are all going to be adults, really their approach needs to be, you can't ask them to tie the shoelace, right? Um, <laughs> it can be something like the example that I gave from the Seattle Public Library. I think that would be more challenging. And even having one of them to facilitate that session, I think that will also be helpful. Thank you for that great question. Hi, um, I'm wondering if you're familiar at all with Dynamic Land, um, which is uh, very similar to some of the um, work that you're doing, um, but kind of takes it to the next level with, uh, in terms of computing together without screens in a, on a table in a, in a physical space. I'm not familiar with that, but I hope you can share that with me, um, and I would be happy to bring it to the uh, Libraries Ready to Code team. Thank you for sharing that. Yep, thank you.
Thank you so much, everyone. Safe travels. Okay, everyone. Again, thank you to Mecca, Mecca as well. Um, we are going to go ahead and take a break. Before I do, though, you lightning talk speakers, you know who you are, and you wonderful final session speakers, you know who you are. During the break, could you please come up with uh, either your link or your thumb drive, et cetera, uh, and we're going to get the sessions done. So please come back here around... I don't know, 10.15, we'll say 10.15. See you in 10.15 and come back because we have giveaways. So we'll see you then. Thank you. Folks from outside, please come in. It's giveaway time. So I know I've never won, so I'm still holding out hope. Hopefully there's no bias. Okay, uh, go, we'll go ahead and take it away for the book giveaway. All right, so I'm hopeful that by this point in the uh, week, everybody kind of understands the rules of the giveaway because um, I don't think I can remember that off the fly. Anyways, we are. You must be physically here to win. Thanks. You have to be physically here. Um, we are going to do five. Um, wait, are we? Yeah. Sorry, I'm taking my cues off the side. Who? Yeah. This is great. Anyways, the moral of the story is we will go ahead and get started. And apologies in advance. I have a difficult name to pronounce myself, um, and I will do the best that I can. Daniel Whitehead, are you here? All right. Martha Roseberry. Woo, you. Come on up. David Anderson. Yay. Frankly, I'm just excited when people are actually in the room. <laughs> Selena Chow. Yes, yay. <laughs> Linda Sato. Yes? All right, we're up to the last one. Moira Downey. Let's see. Yep. All right. And that's it for the giveaway. Thanks. Thank you, thank you. So, okay everyone, uh, we're going to go ahead and start off with the lightning talks. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, coming up we have preparing to host, re or preparing to host regional code for Lib with Melissa Cherry and Craig Bowman. So come on up, y'all. Go for it. Hello. Morning, everybody. Um, since we're preparing to host a regional code for lib in the Midwest, I just wanted to kind of talk about our experiences. We don't have any outcomes yet because we're still preparing to host. Uh, but I just wanted to encourage everyone here to uh, think about uh, hosting a regional Code for Lib because, as we know, a lot of us can't afford to come or for various reasons can't come to a national Code for Lib. 
so also we just want to take a moment to uh, appreciate the DC Local Planning Committee for all of their hard work. <laughs> All right, so of course some of the reasons why people wouldn't be able to come uh, may include, you know, can't take time off work. I don't really like flying, but our train system, I'm still waiting on the bullet train. Yeah, right, so. Um, so also, uh, you know, Code for the Lib, it's sort of my impression, it seems like a leaderless collective, which is a good thing, but that also means like, how do I get permission to host a conference? Well, I'll tell you, Craig, you don't. Uh, she said, y you, you don't. don't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so if you're thinking about hosting a regional code for lib, uh, you know, look for a need, kind of reach out to previous regional uh, planning committees in your area. In our area, I, I reached out to Margaret Heller, um, who is not here this week, uh, but she hosted last year's regional Midwest conference, and she's been super helpful. So shout out to uh, Margaret Heller. Um, and also, you know, like I said, look uh, for the regional planning committees. Got a little ahead of myself. Um, and ask around to, you know, maybe someone else is in your area is thinking of hosting a regional planning, com uh, a regional conference. Um, so some of the incentives for you to host a regional code for lib uh, in your area, you know, maybe you're thinking of uh, a national conference, but you kind of want to do a test run first. Uh, that's that's not happening at Miami. It's no, nobody wants to go. Yeah, I'm sure. um, so, uh, you know, of course, it kind of looks good on annual reviews to be like, I hosted a, you know, a regional code for lib. Uh, more networking and, of course, Jira practice. Everybody loves Jira practice, right? All right. All right. Or not. That's, ooh, got one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, of course, if you're thinking of, you know, how do I develop a local planning committee, uh, you know, it's not I. Uh, or me, it's, it's a team, uh, try to distribute that workload. Um, so the last uh, local uh, regional Code for Lib Midwest, they've been free, so that kind of puts some limits on you. Um, definitely make the most of your institution's resources, um, especially the free ones, uh, those, are, those are very good. And definitely check your library calendar for conflicts. Um, Look for summer alumni weekends, just yeah. giving you a hint. Uh, those sneak up and you're like, oh, that's a thing, yeah. Um, so think about that. And uh, so just one last shout out. Um, so we've put on a, a, up a link for our call for proposals, which is up, um, as well as our link for registration, which is free, um, capped at 50, so get them while they're, while they're mm -hmm. available. Um, see you at Miami. Woo! <laughs> no, no, sorry. Not, yeah. Just kidding. That, See you in Oxford. Yeah. Oh, hi. Uh, yeah. Wrong Oxford. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, obviously, on the wiki, there is some recommended reading, which you would probably want to um, take a look at before you jump into this, like I did, having never attended <laughs> a Code for Live National. Um, so, that could be really good reading for you. Um, and we are open for questions. Um, if you want to know more about Oxford, Ohio, um, we live there, so we'd be able to tell you about that. Um, we're also open for questions about um, hosting and preparing, so let us know. Yeah, cool. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Okay, that's one down. Technology. Okay, nope, that's not it. Nope. We talked about this. Nope. Nope. I don't ask. Nope. Nope. We'll get there. It's okay. You're all see you're all gonna see this soon. Uh, oh, yep, yeah, 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 there it is. Okay. So sorry. We're gonna present this right now. Take it away, Tom. All right. Uh, thanks a lot. So I uh, work at Georgetown Law Library, so um, I'm focused primarily here on law school library websites. And librarians are kind of have a reputation for being staunch protectors of patron privacy, and that was absolutely true back in the days when we had primarily physical collections, but now we send our patrons off to third-party websites where who knows how they're being tracked there. Uh, but I was curious 
how we were allowing third parties to track patrons even on our own websites. Um, so we have lots of embedded content that leads to a lot of third parties coming in, many of which are doing tracking of our patrons on our websites. I tried to emulate the study of um, the top one million sites that a couple of researchers from Princeton uh, performed, and they actually wrote an automated crawling uh, Python script called OpenWPM, which allows you to take this script, give it a long list of URLs, and set some configuration, and then let it go. So um, I wanted to do all of the ABA accredited law school library homepages. Um, so the first thing that I had to do with OpenWPM was populate uh, a browser profile. Uh, it has sort of a headless version of Firefox built into it with Selenium uh, to do all the automated things. And so I crawled the top 10,000 sites on the Alexa list. And um, that was kind of a very motley crew of uh, URLs streaming past my screen on my work computer. Um, so then using that profile, I would then crawl all of the ABA accredited law school library homepages. Uh, the reason why you needed to have that profile built already is because those trackers behave differently if they think they've seen you before. If they're seeing you for the first time, you give them a clean profile of the browser, they just kind of give you an, an initial look. But if they can recognize you from past sites you visited, suddenly the floodgates open. Um, so the results that I got, I, at first I thought that the the stats on the actual individual libraries was going to be the juicy stuff because, you know, catching libraries, tracking their users or whatever. But um, to a certain extent, these numbers are not that, uh, not, not that bad. So initially looking here at the raw numbers, the, you know, the highest school had on an average page load, just a single page load, um, 195.8 uh, third party HTTP, HTTP requests. However, that's all context, so all sorts of things that aren't necessarily doing any tracking. So uh, I should note that uh, my, the first time I did a test run, one school came up with an average of over 400, but by the time I did my, uh, my final data collection, that particular law school closed, so I couldn't include them in my data set. <laughs> uh, so what I did to, to, deter, to distinguish between non-tracking and tracking um, requests was to use easy list and easy privacy, which are some, reg, uh, some regex list of patterns of URLs that are used, that's used in ad blocking software. Uh, it matches up the URL and says that's a tracker. So looking only at the tracking context, you see that that number drops down to just a little under 30 uh, on average for the top school. Um, but however you think about that 30, there can be lots of requests to the same domain. So that doesn't mean there's 30 different parties tracking, it just means there's 30 different requests. So then combining domains down, we get down to an average of 13 uh, for the highest school. Then you have to take into account that different domains can still be the same company. Um, so if you combine all these different domains, identify who owns them and therefore what company is actually doing the tracking, we get down to about 10 for the top two schools. Um, then the question is, so looking at sort of the average averages there, for the actual total number of raw numbers, there's a, you know, anywhere from 20 to 30 average on pages. Um, but when you get down to the actual organizations, you're looking at about two. Every, you know, on average, each law, library homepage has about two third parties tracking people on the page. Then you look at what the most common domains that are doing the tracking are. Not surprisingly, Google Analytics is up there. Uh, it's kind of shocking on library websites to see that 50% have double click showing up, and there's actually an explanation for that, which is if you turn on the demographic tracking on Google Analytics, Google Analytics tells the user's browser, hey, load this URL from double click, it loads it, and then that's, that user's browser serves up their cookie, double click identifies them from all the other sites they visited, and that results in a lot of uh, tracking that then allows the user, to, the, the site, to get demographic information, but also adds their visit to your website to, um, the, to the ad um, ecosystem. Uh, combining that down to domains, uh, only in the tracking context, Google Analytics is still way up there, double click is still way up there. And then finally, combining that down into what companies are doing the most tracking. Not surprisingly, Alphabet, aka Google, is the one doing most of it. Uh, it's a lot of familiar names up there, but really only you know, those top two are even more than 25%. But, but Google is everywhere. Thanks. Thank you so much, Tom. That was awesome. Let's see. It's always the mouse that kills me. 
So coming up next, as I talk about, oh, where is it? Okay, good. I made sure to load all the, all the things, so hopefully. Yeah. Take it away. Hello. So yeah, this talk contains some animations, but they are minor and completely necessary as Sean Overcamp's presentation was. Um, one of my favorite writers is the Argentinian Jorge Luis Borges. In particular, his short stories, which are collected in a couple of books. The one I'm interested for this talk is El Jardín de Senderos que se bifurcan, in English, The Garden of Forking Paths. One of the stories in this book is called The Library of Babel. The story describes a library that contains every 410 page book that can be written with the different combinations of the space, the period, the comma, and the 22 letters of the alphabet, 40 lines in each page. Most books are complete gibberish, but at the same time, there could be two versions of the complete works of Shakespeare that only differ by one letter. Borges's fantastic stories have been an inspiration for many people. As many others, I played role-playing games as a kid these are games that only require a rule set and some dice, but they can get very elaborate with minifigures and other props. I didn't enjoy the specific mechanics of these games. It can take hours just to create a single character, as much as creating maps, monster encounters, and treasures that me and my friends would participate in. Years later, these games surfaced in the internet. Okay, there is supposed to be a video here, but it's not showing. Okay, there you go. Uh, years later, these games surfaced in the internet as text-based real-time multiplayer adventures, also known as multi-user dungeons or MUDs. You would start creating a character and then type spatial and verb noun commands to move around and interact with other players and the environment. In spite of it being such a limited medium, these games could be very entertaining, even addicting. I would spend entire weekends logged in playing, much to the annoyance of my parents, because back then you were built by the minute. Fast forward to seven years ago, I started working at the New York Public Library as a designer and developer at the now defunct NYPL Labs team. I worked in the main building next to Bryant Park in Midtown Manhattan. It's a fascinating marble building and I got to walk around underground areas that are not usually accessible to the general public. It was there where I learned about the different library classification systems like the NYPL's billing system or the Library of Congress system. As you can tell, my background is not in library science. I did know about the Dewey Decimal System, of course. Currently, I work at DPLA, so I think I really caught the library bug. A few years ago, I was curious about representing a library's classification system as a building that you could walk around. Maybe it could be a text-based adventure of some sort. It reminded me of the Borges story. Others have tried to make the Library of Babel a reality. Jonathan Basile did a website that follows the instructions of the book, producing a unique address to every book. The architect Jamie Sawinski did some 3D models also based on these instructions. The library can take many different forms, but in its core, it is still made of hexagonal rooms connected by staircases and corridors. My favorite is the version that can be seen in the movie The Name of the Rose, which shows the labyrinthine building Oops, sorry. I guess it's, well, whatever. The name of the rose that, uh, which, which shows the labyrinthine building, the library and librarian in the Umberto Eco's novel were inspired by Borges' story. Text adventure remixes have also been made. This one, not about the Library of Babel, but uh, Wikipedia by Kevin Davis lets you explore Wikipedia entries as places connected by cardinal directions. It even uses pixelated versions of the entries' images. What would a multiplayer mod version of the, of the Library of Congress classification system based on the Library of Babel look like? I'm, a, I'm calling it the mod of Babel. It must be as automatic as possible. It should be a physical, a physical manifestation of the classification system itself based on the rules set by Borges. Players are librarians wandering the library, finding rooms and books, and completing quests. This is still very much a primitive work in progress. My former colleague and actual library science person, Matt Miller, produced a JSON version of the Library of Congress classification system, which I used as a starting point. 
after some Python and JavaScript work and taking advantage of an existing text adventure framework, this is what I have so far. Each category or class is represented by a building, and each subclass is represented by a room in that building. You move around by typing the code between brackets. Additional subclasses become rooms, or shelves, or racks, and so on. It already supports multiple players that can talk to each other. Eventually, it will support quests where players need to find certain books that open up other buildings or rooms. Please, uh, whoops, sorry. Oops. So please, if you have any ideas about this project, feel free to approach me and bring it up. I will release the source code once I have a better working prototype. You can follow me on Twitter to get the details when I do so. Thank you. Man, I'm so lucky to be at Code for Lib. Okay, coming up next is Chad Nelson with, nope, that's not it. No, maybe it is. No, oh, that's Kim's stuff. Nope, we downloaded that, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah, okay, sorry. Technology, group, enabling, editing. I believe so. It's a uh, mirror directly. Oh, yeah, you're good. Okay. Yep. Um, zero. Okay. Uh, so I'll start this off with a story. A couple years ago, I was teaching a workshop for uh, um, librarians and various other people in the community on uh, data map, uh, like web mapping using uh, op CardoDB. And we were using a, an open data set of public libraries in Philadelphia. And two days before that workshop, the data set went offline, it disappeared. It got merged into some other bigger data set. There was some reason that you know the city of Philadelphia needed to do that, but it was gone. Luckily, I had a copy, but it made me wonder and think, like, is anybody preserving this open civic data? Like, it's being made available, it's quite popular now, but where does it go? Did they think about that? Um, I didn't know. Well, last year, Temple University Libraries got a chance to kind of start investigating that. Uh, we got a Knight Foundation prototype grant to look into, can libraries play a role in preserving civic data? Um, and so we, uh, you know, we did some work, we talked to a lot of stakeholders from uh, data journalists, to legal researchers, to historians, to archivists, to data stewards themselves at various um, uh, city and civic data repositories. And uh, uh, we, you know, attempted to create two kind of prototypes to figure out, you know, is there a way that we can play a role in this and what would that look like? and uh, how would, that, how would it feel? Um, you know, would it work for us? So um, we use as our uh, initial data set, Open Data Philly. It is a community-run open data portal. It's a partnership between the city of Philadelphia, uh, technology company Azavia, and the uh, School of Journalism at Temple University. Um, so it contains not just civic data from the city, but also from other non-governmental organizations, governmental organizations, arts organizations, Craigslist, all kinds of things. Anyone could put data in there, and uh, um, and it, but it's available for the community, and it's uh, it's very popular. Um, so we had a lot of issues. I'm just going to talk about three quick things that we found really interesting and useful. Um, the first was the question of selection. Like as with any good collection development project, you know, we did some selection to say, figure out what we wanted. You know, we did want the crime data from the city of Philadelphia, but we didn't necessarily want the Craigslist RSS feed because um, it wasn't, wasn't something we saw useful. Um, but there were some other questions of selection that were kind of thrust upon us. Uh, we really came to realize we had no idea what it meant to archive an API. Uh, our APIs tend to be designed not to be able to enumerate through all of the items they have. And even if you can, you're gonna have 20, 30, 100,000 JSON files in a big pile somewhere. No, you, no researcher is gonna find that useful. Or at least no, most of the people we talked to would not find that useful. To us, it seemed like APIs were almost like a derivative. They were the kind of low-res JPEG as opposed to the original data that was, you know, maybe in the CSV. I don't know. Unanswered question, but something that really got us thinking. Um, the second was about versioning. Um, so, oh, two of the, the two tools we kind of used to do our uh, to do our harvesting. One was we used Archive It. Uh, we already used that for doing kind of web archiving for our websites, uh, but we decided to try and use that for um, uh, for scraping all this data from Open Data Philly. Um, but we also tried using the uh, um, decentralized data protocol DAT. Um, one of the DAT mem team members was on our uh, advisory board, so that influenced it. And DAT does kind of like 
open, uh, uh, it does version control, kind of similar to Git, um, is the easiest way to explain it shortly. And uh, that was really useful because some of the data that's up on Open Data Philly is, has no change. So the, the crime data is updated every day in place um, online. So whatever you, the CSV was yesterday, if they've made changes to that, if they've altered it, you don't know. So a lot of our users really wanted version control. That was an absolutely essential part of what they wanted and the value that we could add because that's not currently there. Um, we had some issues just like uh, I think that was kind of a little too level, low level for us and we didn't really have the resources to build a whole kind of scraping framework around it. Um, but there's a lot of utility there. Um, uh, some issues um, around like how granular uh, it does its versioning that really we didn't find useful for our uh, our users, but there's a lot of promise there. Um, and the third issue we encountered was one around metadata, um, that we didn't really find a kind of metadata standard that could really encompass all the information we wanted. Um, while the WARC standard has a lot of information about, you know, where you got this file from, it doesn't often, it doesn't provide you a way to think through like, some of our users really wanted to know, particularly journalists and legal researchers who absolutely have to know where the data came from and how you got that data. Um, they needed to know what we'd call provenance, um, but they just called, they wanted authenticity, proof of authenticity. So um, we didn't find a data set, that, uh, a data standard that could work that way. We looked at the open data specification that was talked about yesterday as a wrapper for it, but um, uh, we didn't really come to a great conclusion. So uh, if you have got any questions, I'm happy to answer them, and uh, that's all I got. Thank you. Chad Nelson, everyone. It's Bibliotechy for your Twitter, right? Okay, Bibliotechy, if you happen to be on the Twitter. Okay, next amazing person. Nope, not that one, not that one. Nope, I just clicked on that. Why do I keep going? Apologies, I am scrolling through all the things. Oh, you know what? Nope, that's not it, that's Bria. I'm sorry, Laura. Um, I just saw it. That was my, ah, there, thank you. Um, trying to figure out how to, nope. That's not gonna work. This mouse, okay. Nope. Okay, does that work? Should I just like scroll down? Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> Give it up for Laura, everyone. She's being a champ with my technical difficulties. So, take it away. Um. Hi, uh, can everyone hear me properly? Okay, awesome. Good morning, Code for Lib. Um, before I get started, I just wanna say thank you so much to the scholarship committee for sending me here because this week has been amazing. Um, so, uh, so, my name is Laura and I'm actually not part of the more typical Code for Lib demographic. I'm actually a law librarian. And so I work at a corporate law firm in Canada, and what I do most of the day is legal research, which for me is case law research and legislative research, or business and financial research, which mostly deals with securities filings or compiling documents to support mergers and acquisitions. Um, but what I maybe do that's more relevant to you is I train students and lawyers on the use of various legal research databases. <clears throat> so I provide um, ad hoc support, both of the emotional and technical variety. Uh, I work with people who I kind of call non-expert experts. So these lawyers and students, they are experts in law, but they are not necessarily experts in legal research, and they are not necessarily experts in the use of legal research databases. Um, I have some trouble conveying the value of my training them, because for them, it's actually more valuable to them if I use these tools on their behalf rather than providing training. And this would be fine, except that much like all other industries, law is in the midst of being disrupted. 
Uh, legal startups are starting to bring on corporate law firms as beta partners with the understanding that the lawyers they sign on will help to grow and shape the product. And there's a lot of money to be made in automating the closing of complex deals or using IBM's Watson to try and accurately predict case outcomes using previous case law. But not everyone at the startup knows that a lot of the lawyers who sign on, who are big names or partners or money makers, probably haven't touched a legal research database in years or possibly even decades. Uh, they are non-experts whose expertise is being sought in the creation and shaping of a tool that they probably won't use. But I have to use it, and law students have to use it. And once a research tool moves out of beta and gets picked up by the law practicing public, so small firms, solo practitioners, and people who weren't important enough to be signed on in the first place, um, what happens is usually law librarians wind up being the gatekeepers of the tool. And I become a trainer and a user and ad hoc tech support, and I get all kinds of questions like these. Um, and when that happens, I don't know how to answer, when people ask me, like, why does it do that? I don't know how to answer why it does, does that. And I talk to the sales rep and the account manager, and they don't know how to answer why does it do that. Um, and neither does the product manager, in my experience. Uh, the developer might. But in my time as a librarian, providing training, sending feedback, and pointing out issues with search relevancy and UX confusion and general tinkering, I'm actually almost never able to get FaceTime with the dev. So here's the problem as I see it. Uh, by the time I ever see the tool, we are usually way past usability testing. They have already launched, there is no going back, and what I usually find is that I wind up with a feedback loop. Um, there's the feedback loop on the top where the lawyers provide feedback that gets incorporated, but then they don't use the tool. And then there's my feedback loop, which more looks like a feedback line that goes nowhere. I'm still waiting to get emails from some of my product managers. <laughs> it's fine. Uh, I find myself facing the following issues. Um, first of all, there is the billable hour. Some of my lawyers will bill like thousands of dollars by the hour. I am salaried, and it will always be cheaper or easier to push the work of training and learning of research um, databases to the designated legal research expert, i.e. me. Secondly, I find myself dealing with broken telephone. Uh, sales reps and devs who don't necessarily know that librarians use the tools and don't necessarily know that librarians use the tools because they're only having these conversations with lawyers. And finally, I find myself dealing with an issue of corporate culture and leading by example. Uh, we're a business, we're extremely for profit, we're in the business of practicing law and being profitable. And if, so it's very hard to pin down senior lawyers who are there to make money. And if senior lawyers don't do it, then junior lawyers don't do it, and if junior lawyers don't do it, then students don't do it, and I'm left just like holding all the passwords. <laughs> so uh, I know some of the people in here are devs, and some of you are librarians, and some of you work at startups and small companies, and some of you work at big honking institutions like mine, and I say to all of you, I personally, in this situation, find it difficult to begin to craft the start of a solution. And I would welcome talking with any of you about it in the very short period of time we have left in this conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. I got this one this time. I know, it's a miracle. It's all yours. Thank you, Bria. Thank Go you. That's great. Good morning, everyone. I'm Bria Parker. I'm the metadata librarian at University of Maryland, and I'm going to speak briefly about uh, what happened when someone asked me a question about getting thumbnails for our um, digital images to display in the new and shiny ArchivesSpace public user interface. So where this all began, um, after our migration into archive space, we did, this is a whole nother story, if you wanna hear it, you can find me later, I will bore you with it. Um, we did already have digital objects with persistent links in archive space, but it just had that generic, bland, digital object little icon. So um, one of my co colleagues asked, hey, I heard we can get thumbnails in there, can you figure out how to do that? And I think she thought I was just gonna figure out like which settings and buttons and the configuration. And I was like, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go all out for this. So um, we had recently converted the image server for our digital collections to Mirador and IIIF. And I knew um, from previous work that I could generate 
a thumbnail link using IIIF, so that's exactly um, where my thoughts went. And so how was I going to do that? So I had the um, handle link, and I knew that that was not the ID I needed. Um, that handle link resolves to our metadata record ID. That is also not the ID I needed. Um, our repository structure is such that the image objects are related to the metadata object, so I then had to get from the metadata object to the um, image object ID. And um, for both things, I got an assist from my colleague Josh. Josh Westgard, if you're here, raise your hand. You're awesome. Um, he provided me with a little script, a Python script that resolved the handles in, like, take a CSV file to resolve the handles to metadata IDs. And then I also, um, which is something I do whenever I have a problem, is I comb through all of his um, GitHub repositories to find a Python script that might do the thing I want it to do. And I found one that took a metadata ID from our digital collections, or took a list of them, and got all of the associated metadata and related object IDs and put that into CSV. So I excised that last part out, and finally I had the ID I needed. So um, now to the actual Archive Space API and Python love fest. So that's um, a quick link to the script because I'm going to go through it kind of fast and everything's super truncated snippets that won't look like anything. So from there, I now needed to update the digital objects in archive space with these new um, thumbnail IIIF URIs or um, URLs. So the data I had, I had the digital object URIs from um, when I initially grabbed all the handle links from the digital objects in archive space and I had the handles that I had matched up with the associated image PIDs, and I did all of this matching in Excel because I'm a metadata librarian. That's um, something I know how to do. So I was able to feed those three, um, those three columns into the Python script, and now using the Archive Space API, it could locate the digital object, replace the handle URI with a IIIF link, and then I'd, um, add a second file version array with the handle link, and I could adjust some settings. And so once I got that all sent back to archive space and posted up there, I now had this instead of that digital object icon. Um, and I made the thumbnail huge for this presentation so you could actually see it. And then when I clicked it, it takes me to that. And I felt like this. <laughs> Thank you. So, and finally, while I'm honestly super proud of um, figuring this out with the help of others, um, I share this more as an encouragement to others that are learning how to do new things. If you're newbie coders like me, um, I couldn't have done this a year ago, probably not even six months ago. And I find as I'm gaining more confidence in myself and doing this kind of work, um, and finding and implementing programmatic solutions to problems rather than just defaulting to like, I'm just gonna go through and manually correct these thousands of things. Um, it's also led me to encourage others in my department and division and other colleagues I work with to kind of engage in some programmatic thinking, kind of some of the computational thinking that um, um, Megha was talking about earlier in approaching to solve these problems, even if they might not have the skill for programming, we can at least kind of converse about it that way and maybe find some more automated or programmatic solutions to our problems. So um, thank you for listening. My slides are up on the OSF site and you can tweet me and email me. So thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Bria. Coming up next is Sean. It's already on the tab. It's like I did it, but I didn't do it on purpose. I'm super excited. Okay, take it away, Sean. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, if you know me at all, you know I'm usually a very happy person. I usually have a smile on my face and a perm perma grin. Uh, but if you want to make me really uh, grumpy, you can give me a, a poorly written issue. Um, I have issues with issues, and uh, so, and I do believe actually that they even uh, that bad issues can even lead to bad software. And I'll I'll try to tell you how. Um, but so there are three simple things I think that can be done to write better issues. Um, 
and uh, GitHub is optional. This could be Jira or, or, or whatever you use to track issues. Um, and uh, so if you've created an issue that provides a solution without stating the problem, lacks contextual information, or has no examples of the problem, um, then congratulations, you just offset your work to someone else. Um, and they will not be happy about it. Uh, sometimes, I, I know everybody is really busy, and I, I respect that, um, but sometimes just parsing the issue can actually take longer than the task itself, and if that's the case, it's a real problem um, in my mind. Um, so the first thing uh, I would ask you to do is to separate the problem from the solution, and this can be really hard. Um, it's uh, it, it sometimes, it's just hard to, to, to do that, um, but uh, I'll give an example. Um, as a consumer of drag and drop, I want to have confidence that the dragged icon will appear in my viewer. These are just things I found in the wild that, uh, maybe not the best examples, but they came to my mind. So no one's goal is actually to drag and drop. They want to do something with a file, and um, you know, the, this problem could exist for a user that wants to do something with the file that you know, doesn't use drag and drop, for example, open it in some other way. Um, so maybe a better uh, way to say it would be, you know, as a researcher, I want to know why a IIIF manifest is not viewable so I can follow up with the content provider, right? So like a good error messaging around what the actual um, issue is uh, would, be, would be better. Um, two, provide context. This is a big pet peeve. Try to be a reporter, who, what, when, and why, um, because context uh, has a lot to do with how you um, want to solve a problem. So um, something like this, file manager, make it easier to find where, the download, where to download a file's full resolution image from. Um, okay, so the, what is confusing about this is this particular interface uh, allows you to upload images um, or relabel or reorder these images, and it's, I'm trying to understand why a user would, who just uploaded uh, a high-res image might want to download that same high-res image. Um, so there may be a good reason, um, but I don't know it. Um, but it turns out that after lots of back and forth, okay, uh, our photo duplication staff want access to high resolution images so they can fulfill a patron request. This is problematic because the interface itself has lots of other functions that a photo duplication staff member would not really, um, uh, we would not want them to interact with it that way. So maybe provide an alternate way to get to that, uh, to get them to the solution. And then finally, offer examples. Links, screenshots, animated GIFs if you can even, uh, if there's interaction involved, um, really make developers happy uh, because, um, you know, something like this, breadcrumbs are broken. Uh, okay. <laughs> Are all the breadcrumbs broken? Is it one breadcrumb in the 5,000 page site that's broken that I have to track down? Um, is it a display issue? You know, uh, how do I know how to recreate that? Um, or maybe the data is wrong and I would have no way of knowing that. Um, so, uh, you know, something better might be breadcrumbs do not wrap on mobile devices um, and providing a link to what, you know, where we can see that. Um, that issue. So once more with feeling, state the problem, provide context, offer examples, uh, please. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Okay. I saw, yeah, okay, Andrew, you're up next. Yeah, got the slides up now. Sorry, I'm just super excited about technology. So, okay, take it away, Andrew. Hey, there we go. All right, so what I'm going to be doing here is uh, introducing the idea, or hopefully maybe introducing it, and not sure if you guys are familiar with this, this idea, but the idea is Docker for happy developers. I'm Andrew Gearhart, I'm from here, uh, Pennsylvania State University Libraries. I'm not this guy, but 
this that we're talking about is productively disruptive. Hopefully you're not like this because we're gonna be talking about these. So just warning, sorry about that. Just warning, here be dragons venturing into this realm is not for the faint of heart. Not yet ready, no, just kidding, not anymore. This is what I used to say about a year ago about Docker, but that's not really the case anymore. Um, so been joining a project and been here before. Oh man, all these dependencies, trying to figure out how everything fits together. How do I get this code to work? So Docker's a VM, right? No, not really, okay. Docker runs Linux commands in a Linux environment. Think of Linux environment as a container ship. Uh, it just, let's go ahead and skip past this. This is magic. So there's magic involved. So what's it look like on the developer machine? You got VirtualBox to run on Mac, where you're running Docker on Mac, and the base box runs, again, it's just magic. So let's go ahead and move past that. So Docker for happy devs. So the idea is that you're separating services by container. So you have a simple PHP application, you have a MariaDB container, you have your HTTP container, uh, a Rails app with MariaDB, Rails, Solar, Toolchain, uh, Django application. Uh, this is one of the ones that I've been working with extensively with uh, OpenOni, which is a fork of Chronicling America. Uh, you have MariaDB, HTTPD and Django, uh, Solar, IIIF image server, the four of them run and happily communicate with one another. But why? The idea is that you have a single command that you can create a completely new environment for different projects or different branches of the same project with the consist consistency of a newly provisioned VM without the overhead of a new VM. Uh, so again, but why? So it reduces the time to start from days to less than 12 minutes. Our open only project, when we started working with it, setting up a new developer would take literally two to three days to get all the configuration proper, all the config dependencies resolved, all of the different conflicts fixed. Now we have developers running in less than 10 minutes. Reduces the complexity to understanding your project's code instead of the entire stack. You don't need to know about all those other services that are running everything. Instead, you can just work on the project's code. Reuses images between projects. So you have a bunch of different things that are using MySQL. You don't have to have one MySQL server that has all of the databases, causes issues of those all working together. You don't have to have 15 different MySQL servers that are, uh, oh, I need to run this one and I need to run that one. No, instead, it just uses the same in images and uses different data for those. And then my, one of my biggest whys, imagine external developers contributing code to your open source project in less than 12 minutes. It's a 100% re reproducible environment everywhere. So, any questions that you've held, had to later? Ask later, get your project on Docker, talk about it in Slack. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. Okay. Next we have data cleanup, data migration and cleaning. Uh oh. We got this. No, we're we're good. We're good. It's all good. It's not like I'm like surrounded by technology experts that could help at all. No, it's it's all good. Okay. Go ahead. Right. It's all yours. Hello. So I'm Hui. This is Ryan. We both work for Oregon State University Libraries. The title is kind of oh sorry. Hello, I'm Hui. This is Ryan. We both work for Oregon State Libraries. Don't hold it. Yeah. Okay. okay. No, it's good. Okay. So this is a long title, but what we want to talk about is just a recent migration of our institution repository. And uh, it's a big team effort. The two of us feel obligation to give that a shot because it's amazing. So uh, that's the kind of the license thought or lesson learned from the project is uh, you know, data cleanup. 
shouldn't be an afterthought or optional task of your migration. It must be part of your migration and must be planned ahead of your migration start. So, enough. Uh, this is just a brief, uh, brief introduction. Our institution repository is named Scholar Archive at OSU. It was a DSpace repository. It has 10 years history. And that's a rough uh, statistics, 65,000 uh, 65, items, all kinds of things, ETDs, journal articles, data set. The size is like uh, around 600 gigabytes, most likely because we have data set. And we decide, Oregon State is early adopter of Hyrax. We decide to migrate this from this space to Hyrax 2.0, and luckily we survived that big thing, okay? And again, that's a team effort, so we have to give uh, thanks to all the team members. Again, so the one big thing is that we decide to do cleanup, improve our metadata together with the migration. And we have these two created called this space to Hydra. So you can see it's still called Hydra, not Samara, because it's easy to pronounce. So the input is bags. So it doesn't need to be a DSpace. Anything that's in bags, supposedly we can you know, ingest them into a Hyrax. There's the GitHub uh, repository over there. Because Ruby on, um, Hyrax is a Ruby on Rails application, these two really take uh, advantage of that RESTful architecture. All operations are depend on HTTP, so the request response, response is, is in HTTP. The payload is in JSON. That's it, you don't need to understand the backend of Fedora Commons, Solar, whatever, you can just take advantage of the URI provided by the Hyrax. Ingest, and you can see there's uh, some major features. So it also can approve work, uh, workflow. So for a ETD items, for example, this will go through deposit, review by the library, approved by the graduate school, and go published, all automatically using this tool. So it's a batch upload, it's fully automated, it's amazing, and it's developed by uh, one of my colleagues. So, Ryan. Okay, so in order to make handles still work, we weren't interested in minting new ones, but we definitely wanted the old ones to work. The uh, handle URL was saved to the uh, new records as they were created um, via DSpace to Hydra. And we added a uh, handles controller to Hyrax that does the lookup. And there's a little more to it. And we got a little surprise of what all is actually involved when you're trying to mix and match systems. As of now, the DSpace handle server is still running. We kind of tricked it to point to the right spot. So it, it kicks the request to our app. And then our app does a lookup. And when, that gave us some flexibility to also handle uh, communities and collections with uh, just a YAML file to, and we put, made those go different places, either a solar query or a few things we moved out of the system went somewhere else. Um, so yeah, we developed a metadata application profile for all the different types of metadata we had and the different uh, types and Hyrax for admin sets. Uh, did quite a bit of linked data, creating entities for OCI academic units and degree fields and uh, did some more cleanup and uh, kind of normalizing data entry. This is just a quick overview of um, a thesis, I think. <laughs> I didn't make the screenshot. Uh, and the they're hard to see, but the little sort of external arrow links are um, kind of an, an a, a first start to provide more information for things that are linked data and um, just kind of give an example for the, what we've got now. Thank you. Oh, no, that's not it. Oh, yeah, okay. Yep, enough said. Kim Fan. Oh, God. My heart, like, stopped for a second. I thought I closed the... You know how you close 
the browser and you lose everything, thank goodness they fixed that over time. It's gonna be loading in half a second. Do I have to reload? Okay. Oh yeah, super slow. Oh yeah. Please excuse us as we deal with technical difficulties. Okay, we're offline apparently. No, I don't believe you. I'm gonna argue with the computer. I know it's futile, but. Okay, who broke the internet? Did we finally like fry a router like we did in the past? Yeah. Pardon? Okay, good to know. Can I do it from here? Yep, I need to see it. Yeah. I won't have pretty vis visualizations. I'm sorry. So this is what happens. IT appears and it works again. We didn't even have to turn it on and off again. So. Okay, it's okay. Hi guys, sorry if you can't see any slides. Um, I'll try and be very descriptive. Um, with this presentation. Okay, so we have a problem. Every time we come to this conference, we get to meet and hang out with a lot of amazing people. But eventually, we have to go back home, leaving our sad hearts with only fond memories. So to keep the love train going, sort of, <laughs> this is a plug for contributing to the Code for Lib map. You can find it in the Code for Lib organization on GitHub, and if you go to github.com slash code for lib and look up um, the repository. It was inspired by the Critlib map started by Ellie Collier, aka Ellie Hearts on Twitter, which was made so that Critlibbers can find their local buddies to facilitate meetups. There's a Critlib map right there, usually. Another source of inspiration was querying the map, which was made by a 22-year-old student in Montreal because they wanted to build a platform that allowed people to share their stories so visitors can see that even if they might feel like they are alone, that they aren't. That one worked. And finally, Caitlin and I would like to thank Procrastination. We couldn't have done it without you and without the impending deadline to finish our workshop lesson. This map is very simple, which lucky for us means it will be easy to maintain. It's made up of one JSON file, which can be viewed directly on GitHub. The added benefit of using Git is authentication and the transparent way we can all review contributions, which we realized was important given that as of last week, querying the map was taken down when Trump's supporters started spamming the site. Everyone will have access to the sweet, sweet data, which will be pretty neat to look at in the future if someone wanted to take it upon themselves to analyze the different versions of the data and see how the community is growing and changing over time. So here's how you can get started to contribute to the map. If you have a GitHub account, um, you can fork the repository or get a GitHub account. Go to geojson.io. It's a simple map data editor. Um, but you can also use any other GIS tool that you want. There's a screenshot there. Um, this is geojson.io here. 
um, go to the table view, add a new row with your information. You can also add your own regional group to the map. There's no defined structure, um, so you're welcome to add more columns if you want to add additional information as well. And then just save your changes back to GitHub, create a new pull request, and we'll merge your changes. Um, and that's it. Thanks. So that being said, thank you to all of our Lightning Talk speakers. Uh, any light, yes, big round of applause for them. Um, please, any Lightning uh, speakers from this morning who haven't signed a consent form, please go to the registration desk to fill one out. You basically say whether you're okay with it or whether you're not okay with it, but we still need you to sign it. Um, so that little business has been taken care of. Uh, announcements for those participating in the IMLS grant-funded focus group on digital library content reuse. The first session will begin at 12.30 in the director's room. I don't know where that is, but it will be in the director's room. The second session begins at 4 p.m. and between 3.30 and 4 p.m. refreshments will be provided to all participants. Reminders, if you're leaving early, sadly, please drop off your lanyards at the registration desk. So um, I am rather sad that we got the lightning talks done, if only because that means like all good things come to an end sort of thing. So um, we're gonna be moving on to our final round of presenters for today. So that is rather exciting. I'm looking forward to uh, talking to, or I'm looking forward to listening to them. Yeah, okay, sorry. So um, coming up, we have Jason, J oh, J sorry, I saw Jason on this previous slide. I, I apologize, I just like slipped. Uh, Jacob Sabrowski. Yes, I got another, Pol I'm Polish and I got a Polish name right. So uh, it doesn't happen often. Good morning, I'm Jacob Zaborowski, and I will be talking about preserving Flash on the web. In this presentation, I will talk about the evolution of Flash, a proprietary graphics software. From there, I will examine the software and some of its components. My case study of the web-based animated series Homestar Runner will analyze the complexities of preserving a website tied to proprietary software and playback, and the tools available to preserve it. This work begs two questions in particular. Why preserve Flash on the web, and why Homestar Runner? From a cultural standpoint, they represent a moment in time when media production and distribution were democratized by the emergence of the web in the 1990s. From an archival standpoint, Flash and the web are what made Homestar Runner possible. Without preserving them, preserving Homestar Runner is impossible. So. What is Flash and what does it do? Flash is a proprietary graphics and development software manufactured by Adobe, often bundled with Adobe Flash Player. It is used to create vector-based interactive media, primarily for web-based platforms. A typical Flash interface <clears throat> contains a toolbar with drop-down menus, a stage where graphic objects can be created and manipulated, and a timeline for showing the progression of a flash animation, also indicating how many layers of animation are in a given flash file. Two commonly used panels are properties, which show information about a particular asset being used, and the library panel, where those assets can be contained. Symbols are graphics which can be converted into scalable objects, cloned, and altered without touching the original. The original can also be altered and have that change reflected in the clones. The three types of symbols are movie clip, button, and graphic. Each have their own timelines where the user can manipulate them accordingly. Movie clip symbols can contain frame-by-frame -frame animation as well as be modified in the properties panel, as we can see with the changing colors of the typography here. 
A button symbol allows interactive elements in a flash animation. Its timeline has four frames representing a button's four states. Up, when the button is not being touched by the cursor. Over, when the cursor is hovering over it. Down, when the user presses the mouse down while the cursor hovers over the button. And hit, which shows the response of the button when pressed by the cursor. Buttons can be used to link two separate timelines within a flash project. Here, the animation in the main timeline is hooked up to a movie clip to create an Easter egg by means of clicking on the R in the first GIF. The graphic symbol can be used for static assets and animated accordingly, as we see with this um, animation of Strong Bad. This can also be looped independently of any other assets being manipulated in the main timeline. Motion tweens are an automated way of adding movement from one keyframe to another. The first keyframe is inserted, the second at a later point, and then a motion tween by selecting those keyframes and choosing motion from a drop-down menu in the properties panel. Shape tweening allows the user to animate a transformation like that of the square into a circle seen here. The transformation can also be applied to the color of the shape and refined by using shape hints, which allow the user to guide the movement of the tween from one shape to another. These assets will be generated in a .fla file. Video can be rendered as SWIFTs, one of several video outputs from Flash. SWIFT initially stood for Shockwave Flash and has since been renamed Small Web Format in reference to its use as a small file format for playing back video on the web. SWIFT is a proprietary binary file format owned by Adobe and designed to be played back using Adobe Flash Player. A typical SWIFT file, as interpreted by Flash Player, consists of a header followed by a series of tagged data blocks. There are two types of tags in a SWIFT. Definition, highlighted here in gray, which defines the content of the file and assigns a unique character ID to each part. Each character is stored in a repository called the dictionary, highlighted in dark blue. A control tag, highlighted in light blue, manages aspects of a SWIFT, such as playback and creating or manipulating the characters in a dictionary. Using this graphic to demonstrate the process, a graphic object is assigned a character ID by a definition tag, defined shape, highlighted in gray, and added to the dictionary, highlighted in dark blue. A control tag, such as place object, highlighted in light blue, will copy that character to a list called the display list. Those characters will be rendered on screen using the show frame tag at the bottom, highlighted in light blue. ActionScript is a programming language built into Flash, originally to generate simple 2D animation using basic commands such as play and stop by attaching them to a frame or button inside a Swift to manipulate it within a timeline. Later, it was capable of loading external Swifts into one Swift, which allowed for creating a website interface that used multiple assets instead of relying on one Swift file to do everything. The example shown here is detailing a command to determine and control a movie clip's behavior. Homestar Runner, as a digital object, has a dependency, and that dependency, unfortunately, has a shelf life that is coming to an end on the web as support is reduced or eliminated in favor of HTML5. This has been apparent since 2010, when Steve Jobs of Apple wrote his Thoughts on Flash, where he vowed to eliminate support for it on Apple's mobile devices as a result of its drain on battery life and security issues. By 2015, Flash had become infamous for its zero-day vulnerabilities. A zero-day vulnerability is a security flaw in the piece of software undetected by either the vendor or the front-end user. It can be exploited by hackers before the vendor is even aware of it to insert malware. Usually, when this occurs, the vendor must work to resolve it by creating a patch. This led publicly visible sites such as YouTube to eliminate Flash, the branding of Adobe Flash software as Adobe Animate, and Wired Magazine to proclaim, and die it will, at the end of 2020 to be precise. Adobe announced this past summer that it would be ending support for Flash Player by this date. 
However, it must be taken into account that there are 15 to 20 years worth of Flash-based sites online, and not all of them have made the jump to HTML5. To emphasize, when I initially conducted my research for my graduate thesis in 2017, homestarrunner.com was still on HTML4. As I explained briefly when describing Swift's, Flash and Flash Player are proprietary. While the four file format specifications for the Swift format are available to disseminate, it's still a closed format. To show how this impacts preservation, let's look at this view source of a typical Homestar runner page. We see some HTML, some JavaScript, and some embedded Flash. It appears to be flat, but what looking at this view source tells us is that the hierarchy of the site is locked away inside all of these Swifts. This merits more analysis of the Swift files that make up Homestar Runner. But before I go into that, I will discuss several web archiving tools that I used in my case study. The two most prominent tools for archiving the live web are Archive-It, designed by the Internet Archive of California, and Web Recorder, designed by Rhizome. Both are web-based applications. Archive-It utilizes a crawler that searches and indexes parts of the live web. It manages the URLs in a given collection in the Seeds tab, shown at top, and when you check off the box next to a seed URL and click on Edit Settings, you can select several settings to scope your crawl, such as Standard Plus, which tells the crawler to capture the entire site along with any external sites linked to it. Oh, I should have added, this can be done in the crawl scope. The Hosts tab shows internal and external sites crawled, how much data was accumulated from each URL, and how many documents from that site were or were not crawled and considered out of scope. In the File Types tab, we can see the various file formats that were crawled. At the top of the list, there's a file type called application slash x dash shockwave dash flash. There are 412 of them, and by clicking on that number and opening it in a new tab, we can see a text readout listing all of the Swift files that are embedded in the site. This aggregate reporting is one of Archive-It's most useful features. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Wayback Machine, where you can see captured websites in a browser environment. If you look at the URL, you can see that the Homestar Runner URL is wrapped in a Wayback URL, as well as showing a disclaimer that this is an archived site captured through Archive-It. Here is where we run into another preservation issue with Homestar Runner. If I click any of the interactive elements inside the frame where Bubs is dancing on um, presumably Flash's grave, um, I'm still navigating the Wayback Capture. But if I click on any of the links in the navigation bar underneath, I'm taken to the live site, as you can see below. This is an example of Live Leak, and it compromises the authenticity of the archival capture. I should note this was also evident in public-facing Wayback Captures. In spite of these limitations, I was still able to analyze the captured content. I downloaded a web archive or work file from Archive It. It is an open file format that, as per the Library of Congress, combines multiple digital resources into an aggregate archival file together with related information. It is used for accessing web-based content in an archival state. In this case, the work is taking all the harvested SWIFTs, HTML, etc., and putting it into their own content blocks under a record header. I was able to access the view source of the work and extract some SWIFT files for analysis by simply right-clicking on them and selecting Save As. Getting onto Web Recorder, Web Recorder is predicated on the concept of human-centered web archiving, or archiving a website as a user interacts with it. As we can see here, it is openly accessible to individuals who want to crawl a website. Just copy paste the URL and hit record. This is a different approach to web archiving than Archive It, which is more automated. Web Recorder is designed to be, I would say, not necessarily granular, but maybe more intimate, like kind of micromanaged. There's a scroll page button that can crawl a page for the user without manually scrolling, but that's about it in terms of like something being automated. Works can also be downloaded directly from Web Recorder. And in Web Recorder, here's an instance where a URL is not found when played back in the work file. And this is because in order to record something in Web Recorder, you have to interact with it in some form, i.e. clicking on a link to a page. 
I've heard this approach described as what you see is what you archive. Here we see a collection page of URLs that have been crawled, a timestamp, and the, num the number of the capture session. Here you can see in the upper left hand corner a drop down menu from the replaying button and the option patch this URL. When you select that, you can continue to record pages that you didn't capture the first time around. Of course, with a website that has almost 500 pages, this would take a while, but it is feasible. Using the patch this URL function, I am able to click through and add this capture of an interactive game from the site. Ultimately, Web Recorder allowed me to capture the site, preserve interoperability, and document the navigation experience of the site through the, both through the Swifts and through the navigation toolbar beneath them. And now I'm going to talk about the benefits and difficulties of migrating a closed format like Swift to an open file format like MKV using the Swifts that I extracted from the work file. I downloaded and tested three different converters. The first was I like share. I was able to import the Swift and with it technical metadata such as the version of flash used, the frame rate, and frame count. The audio settings are defaulted to a bit rate of 128 kilobytes per second and a sampling rate of 44100 hertz, which caused trouble with the final output from I like share. Uh-oh, excuse me. But um, here in this uh, video, you can see that the audio is woefully out of sync. I had a hunch that it was because of the audio output, since Swifts were designed to use little bandwidth on computers, and therefore the audio bit and sample rates had to be lower than the default. In this chart on the upper right, we can see a range of audio bit rate and corresponding sample rates. Using this as a guide, I utilized MediaInfo, a command line tool, to generate a text readout on the lower right, containing the Swift's technical metadata, including audio bit and sampling rate. I adjusted the audio settings accordingly, after which the audio and video were perfectly in sync with one another. KBI Soft had limited capability for adjusting the audio output to match the original file. In addition, the look of the content is changed. Oh, excuse me again. As we can still see, the background is um, missing from these shots. There was definitely a white background behind Trogdor when he was burninating all the thatched roof cottages. <laughs> VIP was the easiest one by far to work with because I was able to import the Swift and get a one-to-one -one match when outputting to MKV with the default settings. In terms of open source tools, Archivematica provides a command using FFmpeg for migrating to MKV for preservation and MP4 for access. However, this has been difficult thus far, especially considering that it is meant to be done in the command line, so you can't look at the Swift as it's being migrated. This is problematic for Swifts with interactive elements, like the Easter egg with the button um, symbol that I showed earlier. The converters allow me to click on those elements when they get migrated, but of course you can't do that in the command line. I was also trying to run a program called Swift Tools recently, but with no success. Of course, this issue is part and parcel with preserving any proprietary format. Documentation from a preservation standpoint is scarce. During my research, I found one article written on preserving Flash from 2004. Seen here is an example from the UK National Archives Pronom Registry, which offers scant information on Swift. I did have better luck with Swift Reader, which allowed for better file analysis. I was able to see the order in which the objects were assigned characters and pulled from the <clears throat> dictionary into the display list before being shown. I could also look at the file's hexadecimal and see the Swift's file signature. I have attempted to do some work with a decompiler to see how the components of the file look when reduced to their individual parts. However, there is shaky legal ground that goes along with using a decompiler when you're trying to decompile a closed file format. This is a good time to note that Homestar Runner benefits from a sizable fan community, which generated this wiki containing useful information about the site, its content, and its various iterations over the years. This will be useful to capture and analyze as well. 
This case study shows, if anything, that preserving Flash on the web does not have a one-size-fits-all solution. These are some of the tools and strategies currently available for preservation. Recently, the, home, the creators of Homestar Runner, Mike and Matt Chapman, have been experimenting with reworking the site in HTML5. They have done this with one of the interactive games, and it appears to have been successful. As nice as it would be to call it a happy ending to this saga, though, the truth is, Truth is that there is still a race against time as archives must contend with reduced support for Flash and websites created using it. This, the frame grab of uh, Firefox on the top, which will not play Flash content, versus Google Chrome, which is still playing it but will be phasing it out eventually, is proof of this. It is also proof of the work needed to preserve the essential characteristics of web-based Flash media in an archival context. How well will the navigation work? Will the animation play properly when relying on an outdated and vulnerable, I mean, without relying on an outdated and vulnerable plugin? Can interactivity and interoperability be maintained? It is worth concluding with this quote from Strongbad. <clears throat> the internet is a place where nothing ever happens. You need to take advantage of that. <clears throat> were, <laughs> were that the case, the task of preserving Flash on the web would be easier. However, the internet is a place where much happens, and it is the duty of cultural heritage institutions to preserve its footprint for posterity. Hopefully, this talk has highlighted the need to do so and stressed that there can be no one-size-fits-all approach to preservation, but rather one that is multifaceted and considers the web as the complex and constantly evolving entity that it is. Special thanks to my thesis advisor, Donald Menerick at New York University Libraries, and special thanks to my academic advisor, Howard Besser at, M at New York University's Moving Image Archiving and Preservation Program, and Mona Jimenez. Thank you again. I can be reached at jzaborowski at getty.edu, and I'm also on Twitter at Free the Files. Okay, up next is Amy Wickner with Web Archiving and You, Web Archiving and Us. Do I need to refresh it? Um, okay. Cool. Yeah, I don't think it does. But. Oh, you're going to know it's free for it. <laughs> Hey, well, hello, and thank you for the opportunity to also talk about web archiving. Can everybody hear me? OK, two people can hear me. Cool. <laughs> so this talk is about what stakes the Code for Loop community might have in documenting particular experiences of the live web. Um, in addition to slides, I'm also leading with a list of uh, material tools and trainings that I relied on in putting together this talk. Um, and I'll only be able to touch on a few of them. So. Despite the limited scope, I hope you'll dig into the resources and find something of personal uh, resonance to and relevance to pursue further. Okay, um, to begin, this is how the internet, sorry, International Internet Preservation Co Coalition, or IIPC, defines web archiving. Uh, to break this down a little further, um, collecting portions means not collecting everything. There's a process of selection involved. Um, archival format implies that long-term preservation uh, in stable formats is the goal, um, as well as stewardship. And serving the archives for access and use implies that a stewarding entity conceptually separate from the bodies of creators and users of web archives is present and involved in the process. This also implies that there is no web archiving without access and use, and we'll see a few examples that might trouble some of these distinctions as well as reinforce them. And then another point of definition, when I use words like trouble as a verb, critique, or question, I mean in the sense of inquiry, not in the sense of condemnation or judgment, um, also being a grad student. So preamble's mostly over. Uh, between us, we here in this room and on the live stream and so on, represent collectors of web-based web material, subjects of captured websites, and users of web archives. Um, but to confirm, let's do a quick poll. Please raise your hand if you are a collector of web-based material. Okay, fair number, thank you. Um, so as individuals, collectives, and agents of institutions doing web archiving, 
We manage many moving parts in attempting to document even a small part of the living web. And here's a short list of areas that influence our practices. For example, web development affects the archivability of websites. Uh, personal tech influences how people produce and consume web-based material. Um, regime change, fine, leads to federal policy change like the end of net neutrality, um, content appearing and disappearing, um, as we heard in Chad's talk earlier, as well as uh, large-scale collaborations like the end of term archive, excuse me, and the internet archive moving its servers to Canada. So, um, corporate policies and practices like terms of service, DRM, and other kind of policies that affect how we use the live web and how we um, build our presences online. As we heard in Mark Matienzo's overview of IndieWeb, these are also strong influences on web archiving. And then there's uh, trends in ethics, including a growing discussion of privacy as contextual integrity, and uh, especially in online spaces, as well as concepts and movements like the right to be forgotten. So as collectors, we also work within the specific context of our biases. Um, web archiving is an appraisal practice in which collectors assign value to material and take actions accordingly. Um, we aren't always able to articulate the values or the practices or itemize them. Usually we lump them together under the, the word save, for example, or archiving. Um, however, appraisal as a fundamental archival practice has been really hotly contested for over a century and I have a syllabus to share if anybody happens to be interested. So this, on the slide, this text is one of the more accessible and increasingly relevant approaches to appraisal articulated by Vern Harris, a South African archivist in 1988. Um, he argues that appraisal is where power is most concentrated in archivists, and not just within our, ourselves, but also in our practices and the institutions we represent, and that appraisal is closer to storytelling than a science. So trying to artic articulate that story is one way we can grow as web archivists and improve our practice. Improving our appraisal also comes down to not only be, being competent, but critical and curious users of web archiving tools. And I thought Jacob's talk was a really excellent example of what that could look like. So as starting points, I recommend two blog posts by Ashley Bluer, uh, one that introduces in a really approachable way the technical side of some really popular web archiving frameworks, um, and another that uh, explains the links between archivability and accessibility. They're really like this, is what she convincingly argues. So thanks, Ashley. <laughs> Um, we can also look at how labor impacts web archiving. So how much time do you spend if you're, as you're collecting on each part of the process? And what kind of work even is web archiving? It also helps to put faces to the names of the developers, designers, and archivists that are behind the tools. So get to know your archive at support staff. Um, and another example, the developers at Archivo.pt, the Portuguese web archive, uh, recently put out a really honest video talking about some of, their, uh, some of the challenges they face and the improvements in the process and how they're trying to basically make services better from top to bottom and how they've had roadblocks along the way. And documentation like this can really give us insight on the care and feeding of web archives. So that's an overview of how collectors and web archiving mutually shape one another. Uh, next, we can consider how web archiving impacts subjects represented in them. And in fact, much of the power archivists wield is in how we describe or create metadata uh, that tells the story of a collection and its subjects. So another poll, please raise your hand if you're a subject represented in web archives. This is a trick question, it's all of us. <laughs> Hands up, okay, thank you. So how are we represented as subjects and why does it matter? Uh, to get at why representation in web archives matters, let's consider how you and I are represented on the internet. Many of us come face to face every day with the reality that the web is not so friendly to us. It's not designed for us to use. Uh, it's designed to, in fact, to propagate and privilege limited or misrepresentations and har harmful representations, all of which have real impacts on our well-being. Some of the most uh, spaces that are most nominally designed for participation, like Twitter, Wikipedia, I don't really want to go on, okay, Reddit, um, these can be some of the most unwelcoming. And there's the tumultuous experience of trying to manage our own identities and safeties online. When we talk about the right to be forgotten, some of the immediate responses are things like shame and shouldn't have anything to hide, as well as responses related to government overreach um, or you know, the threat of censorship and accountability and democracy. Um, protecting privacy is now treated as an individual rather than as a collective responsibility. 
and the admirable work of the Electronic Frontier, Frontier Foundation, Library Freedom Project, and more only emphasize that corporate policies and practices and institutional policies and practices really trend towards not respecting privacy. Um, maybe they always have, I don't know. So we know the power of archival representation. We know that bias, myths, and underrepresentation are rampant on the web, including in highly participatory spaces. We're aware of access and accessibility issues and all of the above, so what warrant could we possibly have to think that web archives are any different? Web archives perpetuate unresolved issues that affect us as subjects and for which we bear responsibility as collectors. Communicating the context of web archiving to people or robots who might use them in the future um, is one way to confront these issues. And there are raging archival debates uh, throughout the mid to late 20th century about to what degree one needs, archivists need to consider uh, potential users or actual users in their process of appraisal. Um, even today, uh, there are probably small fires smoldering along those lines. You know, can also see in any system, even nominally based on the Open Archival Information System, OEIS, uh, we're meant to designate a community as part of justifying uh, preserving data of any kind. So it can be illuminating to examine our assumptions about audience in preservation practices. So now please raise your hand if you use web archives. Oh, even better, okay. So how do people use web archives anyway? Uh, there are lots of different ways. Artists use them as uh, sources for remix and critique, what Colin Post calls plural and heterogeneous archives. Courts are starting to understand the legal uses and limits of web archives as evidence, including whose interests it serves to use web archives as evidence. Um, sorry, lost my place. Oh, historians, of course, use, use web archives. Um, they've used them for projects like studying political engagement and uh, discourse. Although it's also been pointed out uh, that today's web archives aren't so, aren't so conducive to historical methods, especially traditional historical methods, so it's not super accurate to call them, to refer to them as the historical record. And of course, journalists and the general public use them for receipts. I'm sure many of us have done this. Maybe you see yourself in one of these categories, um, even though I left a lot of them out. But let's also think critically about lines of inquiry we could take. So again, trouble, critique, inquiry, question, as users of web archives to critically read as well, uh, much as we learn to critically build. Fundamentally, this means approaching them as having been constructed in different ways and for a variety of purposes. And just like any other archives, the narrative of how they're built is closely tied to the stories they tell and how they represent the world. So if you're, familiar with, if you're super familiar with web archives and web archiving, uh, you can try making them strange, stepping back and thinking what would a complete newcomer see coming to this interface, coming to this collection. So one exercise that I tried recently is looking at web archives to, through a few different uh, theoretical lenses uh, for the post-colonial study of science, technology, and society. I was also taking a class. I needed a convenient example. So here are some of the questions that came out of that critique. And if you are in the OSF repository in the resources sheet, you can scroll to the very end to see some more kind of slightly more in-depth but still pretty short takes on these lenses um, and how I use them to try to understand web archives a little bit more. Um, and you'll notice that those critiques don't necessarily play nicely together, but the point is to elaborate sort of the landscape um, of critical reading. The point is that you can ask questions about web archives through an existing critical framework or you can roll your own, whatever helps you to step back and make them strange. So you can ask questions like, what is this doing here? What is it? Uh, who decided it should be here? Who did the work? Uh, what has not been documented or preserved? And why not? And people have been doing this for years. Uh, one of the first pieces in First Monday from uh, August 1996 uh, concerns the mysterious disappearance of the White House speech archive from the Clinton administration. It disappeared, it came back, it disappeared again, and somebody wanted to know why, and they wrote an article about it. Um, as collectors, we can try to anticipate and answer some of these questions. So uh, the, I think the UK Web Archive does a really good job of explaining some of the gaps in their collection using um, kind of standard tools like they make their collection criteria public. They talk about, uh, they show the actual forms used to appraise websites and they also do some visualization of what's in uh, and known to be outside of their web archive. So as an extension of critically reading web archives and critically building them, um, members of the Code for Lib community might also explore DIY web archiving. Um, but why might we want to do this? Personal digital archiving is one reason. So you can record your Twitter feed before you quit forever to join Mastodon. 
You can capture your website before changing platforms. You can generally get organized. Personal web archiving might also take the form of memorials where you collect evidence of a loved one um, and tell you know, your story and memories about them. Um, it's also likely that more web archives are better both for redundancy and for representation. So the more people care enough about something to save it, the more likely it is to last. Um, there's also the semi-extreme project of creating, burying something that you want to hide within vastly more web archives. Um, and that's, I mean, it's not very practical, but it's out there. Uh, some web archiving speaks more to the work world. Um, in the most recent round of updating documentation at work, I replaced every link with a perma.cc web recorder or a Wayback Machine URL just in case. Um, I've also suggested to colleagues that they use small-scale web archiving, so um, including drawing on existing collections like our institutional archive it, to document their work for performance reviews, tenure dossiers, and all of the favorite activities of the neoliberal university. Perma.cc, in fact, emerged from law librarians' concerns about link rot, which shows up all over from uh, legal opinions to scholarly communication and beyond, obviously in the news um, as well. Speaking of the news, um, we can see this is another way in which how we preserve our work impacts how social institutions continue to run and knowledge continues to circulate. So you might remember the sudden uh, Gothamist DNA info shutdown last November, um, after which journalists really uh, scrambled and struggled to recover copies of their clips before the site came back online, I believe. So Paul Ford at F Train generated a list of 12,000 clips and their URLs and their dates and authors and basic information that he posted on Twitter. This top quotation is sort of his reaction to the whole situation. Um, and also recently, the Freedom of the Press Foundation and Archive it partnered to archive the alternative press threatened by wealthy buyers. So that uh, the second quotation is a little bit from their press release. And you can watch the documentary Nobody Speak for uh, a better understanding of the threat there. Many of us also pour labor into online creativity and community, uh, where critical web archiving is also completely applicable and valuable. So it's not news to anyone here, but people treat websites as repositories all the time. Uh, from the Marxist Internet Archive to the Egyptian Most Serene YouTube Archive, uh, documenting video evidence of police brutality. Uh, putting text, video, sound, and images online are a means of preservation. It may not be through long-term, secure, geographically diverse storage, in archival formats, but it's certainly through use and reuse. The book, uh, the really excellent book, Rogue Archives, describes how online fan archives are built through a process of repertoire, so reproducing um, archival practice and transmitting the archival practice. The way that works, uh, members of a community archive uh, will encourage users of the material to contribute their own content, including stuff that remixes what's already in the archive. And that's a way to uh, yeah, transmit archival practice and reproduce it. And this is also where we can start to expand the scope of how we think about web archiving to really push at elements of the IIPC definition, like archival format and access and use. So two Twitter threads have gotten me to really expand my thinking recently about the terms and use of, uses of web archiving. This one was started by the sociologist and poet eViewing, and it features text retellings of Twitter users' favorite binds, RIP. The result was a shared creative and memory practice that also continued for a couple hours on the hashtag Vines Without Vines, and I think some of those tweets are still up if you click in the slides. So Vines Without Vines reanimated and celebrated precarious web content. I don't know uh, that long-term preservation and access were really the point, but as you can see in the second slide, it's really just more about bringing community together. Um, and this thread also led to a personal first of contacting someone's creative agency to request permission to screenshot tweets for a public presentation, which I got. So, pretty pleased about that. The other thread, which I didn't ask permission to screenshot, uh, was started last week by the filmmaker Matthew Cherry, using the hashtag GIF History. Um, and in this thread, Cherry matches really super well-known reaction GIFs with the videos that they came from, tracks them down, takes user uh, input, and so on. Uh, the first person I saw retweeted added, this is really important web archiving happening here. And at first I thought, ugh, archiving. But I'm inclined to agree, actually. Again, I don't know that GIF history itself lasted that long. It was a couple hours. Um, I don't know that it's going to last that long. Uh, but like Vines Without Vines, it pushes the boundaries of how we can think about web archiving. Some of us running across either of these hashtags and threads might think, Someone needs to save this, or more tone appropriate to archivist Twitter, I really hope someone is saving this. Again, uh, it's really important to make sure people in the future can understand the, you know, that there was a rich variety of internet lives and get to know those um, and learn about them. Uh, but while springing into action to save something, 
consider whether it's yours to save, uh, whether it was meant to be saved, what value you individually add by saving it, um, and if you go ahead anyway, how you plan to contextualize it and explain that background and explain your decision making. So an example of what this critical process looks like, uh, Nina de Jesus gave a talk at the 2014 Gender and Sexuality and Information Studies Colloquium about building a web archive of blogs by, in her words, marginalized people. She approached the project as a newish insider to this group, running WGET on blogs that she worried would soon be taken down by their authors in, re in response to exploitation and plagiarism. Her talk centers on the importance of consent and agency and preservation, and this is how she concludes. So as part of understanding how we collect, use, and are represented in web archives, consider also how preservation and access are times are linked and our times are not. How access might be neither universal nor given um, and how sometimes there are good reasons for that. Asking these questions can be a core part of doing our web archiving. Um, the practical details like which tools work for you will depend as much on your critical readings, not just on how comfortable you are learning new software and the command line and so on, although these are certainly non-negligible non factors as well. Um, one way to participate in web archiving is to add URLs to an existing web archive, such as Internet Archive, archive.is, perma.cc, and website. Um, if you prefer to store, store your own material and feel pretty good about using command line utilities, which I don't want to assume, um, WGET is a flexible free utility that follows HTML links to recursively download files from web servers following specified parameters. And I want to thank Sam Abrams, uh, Andrew Berger, and Jared Drake for pronunciation help. Uh, <laughs> some everyday use cases for my personal life are downloading blog posts or grabbing MP3s from a bunch of podcasts at once. I'm low on time, so I won't uh, run through all of the different tools represented here. These are just scratching the surface of what's available. Um, you can find more what I hope are practical explanations of how they work in, this, in the slide notes, as well as in the resources list. But I want to conclude by, by reminding everyone that ultimately web archiving is about capturing and recapturing aspects of the experience and performance of the live web. And how exactly that happens is up to collectors, users, and subjects to negotiate together. Thank you very much for your time. So next up is uh, Don't Get Mads About It by Blakely McDowell, Crystal Sanchez, and Walter Forsberg. They don't have slides. I thought I was imagining things. But we will use the live web, which is going to be kind of scary. It's, uh, it's risky. Thank you. You want to say why won't <laughs> Yeah, sure. Hello. Um, Blake and I are from, uh, I'm Crystal Sanchez, and this is Blake, and um, we're from the Smithsonian. And um, I work at the Office of the Chief Information Officer, which is a central IT service arm at the Smithsonian that services all of the different museums and archives and libraries. And Blake works for the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, as a media digitization and conservation specialist. And Walter Forsberg, who um, is also on the program, is not here. Um, he's, he was he moved the, to Mexico City. He moved to Mexico so. City last week. Um, <laughs> um, but we do uh, want to shout out to him. Hi, Walter, um, if he's watching. He was a huge force in the creation and um, advocacy for this tool that we've built. Um, and so our presentation is, um, we're just going to stand up here and talk about this tool that we built, um, and that went live last week, so we're st still a work in progress. And some of the things that we learned about it, um, uh, Blake and I are both trained media archivists in, in digital preservation, so this was a new aspect for us. Um, and so first we're going to give you a bit of context for um, the need and um, some of the requirements that came out of a survey that we did across the museums um, for a web uh, video player. We um, don't have one in-house. Um, we do images really, really well. 
and um, d uh, storage delivery um, automation uh, scale um, transcription um, with our digital ecosystem. And um, but we don't do we didn't do video very well. So um, we looked at the the need and uh, kind of thought about and we looked at all the different solutions that were being deployed across the Smithsonian and um, we thought about um, what we could provide centrally um, in and that would fit inside of our it, ecosystem so um, we we are going to um, go rogue here and and just show um, we have three links that there I tweeted is. out um, <laughs> that that uh, Blake's gonna pull up and we're gonna um, watch some videos um, that were deployed on the player, talk about the player, and um, then at the end, some musings about what we learned um, throughout this whole process. All right, thanks, Crystal. Um, so yeah, in September 2016, the 19th uh, Museum of the Smithsonian Institution, the National Museum of the African American History and Culture, opened on the mall. Um, often referred to, at least internally, as the first digital Smithsonian. Uh, the museum started with, uh, was the first museum to start without a collection at the Smithsonian, so the collection was built after, um, in 2003, the museum was um, approved to be uh, funded and opened. So when we opened officially in 2016, we didn't have a very large uh, media collection of either analog or digital assets, but it was quickly growing, but what we did have was a very well-funded, very well-staffed, um, with lots of cool equipment, uh, media digitization lab, where we could quickly, internally, um, digitize many of our analog film collections, our analog audio collections, our uh, extensive analog video collections, and also uh, quickly process our digital collections uh, with the goal of getting them available to public uh, researchers, scholars. Um, but what we didn't have, as Crystal mentioned, was a video player and a way to really do that for a lot of our assets. So um, we were putting stuff on YouTube. We had a Vimeo account that was being paid for by staff briefly at one point. Um, we, uh, yeah, we just really wanted to be able to make stuff accessible and there was, it was really hard to do both for um, you know, legal reasons, putting stuff on YouTube, Vimeo and stuff, you give up all sorts of rights uh, that are really ambiguous but you know deeply embedded in the legal jargon of those websites uh, so yeah as crystal mentioned we about a year before we opened uh, the museum along with uh, the office of the chief information officer at the museum uh, had been able to corral money and support from upper management to look into building a uh, video player so we looked at some commercial products that maybe everyone's familiar with, like Kaltura, um, Media Haven. We looked at many, there's a lot out there, more than I ever knew. Uh, yeah, could learn a lot about that. Um, but ultimately decided that to best fit the needs of the institution and our users and the various museums and the requirements we knew we had, it was going to be best to really hire a, uh, a vendor, programmers, um, and build one sort of in-house so that it would be internally linked to the Smithsonian. There was no way it could ever uh, be defunded in a certain way. Um, and so that's what we decided to do. Yeah, embedded in the... Uh, in, in the infrastructure. Um, and what we came up with was MADS, uh, the Media Asset Delivery System, which we've been testing and tweaking and building and having lots and lots of meetings about and pulling our hair out over for the last year and which officially went live February 5th. Yeah. So we're gonna, yeah, test it kind of in front of you. Um, <laughs> there's, there's a couple different points of access you can get to this. Uh, one of the main ways that people uh, interact with the Smithsonian's research collections and just collections in general is through Smithsonian collection search, which is collections.si.edu. I typed in the name Pearl Bauer, Bowser, which who is a, a filmmaker from New York who we have a large collection of her films. And so a lot of this metadata here pulls from the Smithsonian dams. And uh, yeah, we've, we've all seen a video play on the internet, but um, can, it handle? can it handle it? What's going to happen? Uh, so to meet um, mm -hmm, web uh, 
All right, well. <laughs> to meet um, web content accessibility guidelines, all of the videos that go into MADS need to be captioned. This one's silent, so it's actually not going to um, show captions. But uh, if you were to click down here, there'd be a closed captions uh, button. And that uh, that's great. It's also a huge ask for, um, you know, places that don't perhaps have funding to do captioning, which is very time consuming, costly, and uh, yeah, gonna be interesting to see how various institutions um, work with that. But so you can see here there's that, that should be playing, but uh, slow internet. Um, this is a 60 Miller black and white uh, event, uh, film from uh, 1964, shot by the Bedford Stuyvesant Youth in Action group, uh, sort of documenting a, uh, like a fashion show, it's very cool. Um, but I feel sad that it's gonna move before it really plays all the way. Just leave it, I'll talk. Okay, but I was gonna then mention the other way you can enter it. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry, one other, the one other way you can get to stuff um, playing on MADS is through the Smithsonian Online Virtual Archives, which is different than Collection Search. It's more for finding aids and stuff. Um, we, this museum has a home movie project where the public can bring home movies in and have them digitized, and if they want to leave a copy in escrow with the museum, they agree to have it stream online. So uh, it's called the Great Migration Home Movie Study Collection. Um, so if you were to click here, Someone else mentioned the cool icons for digitized content. I'm a big fan of the Sova one, which is a box with with light coming out of it. Digitized uh, stuff. Oh, man. Finally, well, yeah. Finally, one other way you can reach it is, this is probably the most solid one at the moment, actually, too, is through our website, the Center for African American Media Arts, um, where we can see things like, let's see, tribute to Malcolm X, because I know this has, and I'll just let that play while Crystal does some talking. Some talking. Okay, um, a little bit of context for the systems. Um, at the Smithsonian, we have a digital asset management system that has become a central component, um, key, key um, initiative. Can we make this a little? Okay. Um, and we have, uh, it's grown into a kind of a monster. It services all of the museums and archives and libraries, and we have um, 15, 16 million files in it right now and over two petabytes of storage and we expect it to uh, grow exponentially. Um, and we have a, a portals in and portals out for images and we have an image delivery service which is how we came up with media asset delivery, media asset delivery service. Um, and, um, and, and integrations with all of our different collection management systems, archive space, TMS, Emu, Mimsy. Um, so, uh, as you can imagine, a variety of, of uh, systems that are all kind of integrated together. So, the goal was to be able to kind of, um, because we have over 600 users who enter the um, system and manage their digital collections from various points of entry, um, we really needed to be able to. Um, provide that same functionality for video um, to be able to flag things inside of our digital asset management system where masters are kept and deliver them out to the public and make them available for streaming with static links that are predictable and use IDs with, from within inside of our digital asset management system. And, um, and so the goal is really to not make silos like ever um, that we have to maintain. Um, and to be able to deal with uh, scalable, scalability, um, the size of our collections, and to be able to predict cost. And so with a lot of these streaming platforms, what we learned is like they charge you for when you click on how many users click on uh, videos and how much they watch at what kind of bandwidth. Um, and that's just really not a, a solution, a cost solution that works for the government. So. Um, so what we came up with was this kind of hybrid approach. Um, we built it internally, but we really we have a vendor who helped us with like packaging and transcoding for adaptive streaming. So we create, you know, you can kind of flag things inside of our digital asset management system, the collection managers themselves, and then um, files automatically get kind of packages get generated and uh, delivered to um, a space where they go through this kind of transcoding box and get um, packaged together. 
to then, and that's sort of our vendor kind of middle point that is um, an on-prem solution, and then delivered up to the cloud, or now we're working with internal um, servers to stream our content from inside of our data center. So kind of trying to do um, uh, a, a kind of a hybrid approach that's sustainable, but also creates these points all along the way that we can um, pull pull out pieces and plug them in. If we don't, you know, if we wanted to switch vendors or switch um, streaming storage platforms, um, and still have sustainable links that are embedded in finding aids, um, and don't need to be fully managed by by people all the time because they're, you know, we're all busy. Um, so that's pretty much the solution that we came up with, um, and it, it uh, we, we sort of developed this over the last two years, I think, with a lot of talking and a lot of um, stakeholders meeting, and um, we have three minutes left, so I think we wanted to maybe kind of end with some musings, we're calling them, some findings that we, that we discovered, Blake and I, working through this process, um, and um, I think the first thing we were talking about is it always takes longer to do something like this than you expect, and you guys all know that, right? Um, wait, wait. <laughs> Add a year. Um, well, especially at an institution like ours that's quite large um, and has many stakeholders because we had to involve all of them, from curators to um, the web people to vendors to IT staff, um, administrators, um, and to all have their kind of um, voices heard. and. What we learned is that we did a really good job at um, gathering and building requirements for what we needed in a system but um, across the institution, but we didn't necessarily start with a good set of requirements in the beginning of building it. And I think we with came up with those. Yeah, we came up with those later, but I think that's really helpful to have clear requirements uh, laid out that um, that are uh, agreed upon by everybody. And then having timelines, um, that was really big too. I think um, we did a pretty good job at that towards the end, um, but things that we were learning. Meeting, make sure you have regular meetings. We started to have weekly meetings and that like propelled us forward so much, so much faster because um, there was no project manager on this. We had this mandate and we had this great need and we didn't have a lot of resources attached to that. So it's kind of like you're still working with the same amount of people and, um, and, and money. So, um, so just trying to be able to fit that into your life. We had regular meetings and we kept notes. Blake started keeping notes, it was great. Um, <laughs> that Email we could work off everyone. of every time. Yeah, after the meeting each week. <laughs> um, and then really um, having clear communication with the, te the technical support. Um, Blake and I have various pieces of knowledge and a lot of people inside the Smithsonian, but we knew that we needed a little bit more in this area and um, and really formed that relationship and we learned a lot, I think, that um, a, about the needs of streaming video um, and, um, and kind of trying to build a system that is really sustainable and will live past us, hopefully, um, without a whole lot of link, yeah. link rot. Um, and, um, and really uses tools that are out there, like this is a JW player, which is open source player, it's just sort of customized for us. Um, and uh, automation was in systems integration is huge for us. And really um, breaking down the project into various components that we were able to kind of like, you know, sprinting, um, like agile development, but for require, uh, the, whole, the whole team. Um, so the requirements themselves, like we built the core package and the, re the required metadata and where it needed to go and how it needed to display. Um, what kinds of files we need to stream on what devices, things like that, um, and then the automated piece, and now we're working on audio support. Um, yeah, and so now we have this player, and I mean, streaming video on the internet is nothing new or fancy, obviously, but uh, it's really great that Smithsonian has this and can, you know, on its own terms, so to speak, make these collections uh, really readily accessible to the public and researchers and we're pretty excited about it. I highly encourage you to go to the CAMA website and look at some of these awesome videos, which I guarantee are not, most of them are not anywhere else. And yeah. And go to the museum. And go to the museum, yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
Okay, hello everyone. Uh, last talk, we have Stay JSON Schemen, an open source metadata validation workflow for large scale media, media preservation projects. So that's up on the screen. Um, will it be, it's, will it be in just a second. Okay, all right, cool. Okay. All right, well, it's not, yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, so, hi everyone, last, last presentation of uh, this amazing conference. Uh, it's our pleasure to present to this amazing community. My name's Nick Krabenhoft. I'm the uh, Digital Preservation Manager at New York Public Library. I'm here with Genevieve Havemeyer King, who's the Media Preservation Coordinator um, at that very same library. And today we're talking about uh, moving our metadata format to JSON and how that's working out eventually. Um, so, uh, NYPL is preserving a quarter million audio and moving image media through digitization. Uh, the physical media is dying, and uh, their con but their contents will still be accessible from our migrated versions, uh, four petabytes and counting currently. Uh, we've written a lot about the specs for that process, and you'll see a slide about that eventually. Um, but uh, there's a link to our GitHub to show you what, what uh, we're talking about there, but uh, what we want to talk about today is the metadata files. So there's a lot of great metadata standards out there, like AES 57, PB Core, and Premise. Um, we borrowed a lot from those efforts when we originally started. Um, and uh, that was back in about 2005 that we started doing digitization. And this is slightly concerning. Yeah. From other window? All right, well, oh, all right, there we go. All right, so, um, yes, uh, so yeah, links and what a package looks like. Uh, so, back in 2005 when we, you know, typically started doing digitization, we borrowed from a lot of these specs about what our metadata should look like, and with uh, only a few IT resources available at the time, uh, the tool that we used to record that information was, of course, Excel. Um, and eventually we did upgrade uh, as you can see in this uh, screenshot, and we moved it to Google Sheets. Uh, so screenshots, they do make a lot of sense in production. Uh, there's a gridded scaffolding, you can build some templates, you can really quickly see all the data that you've collected. Um, you know, the software is pretty widely available and relatively familiar for uh, staff of, in all uh, roles within a large process like that. Um, everyone can read Excel, right? Well. Downstream from digitization work, spreadsheets' advantages can turn into disadvantages. So by 2015, we were looking at tens of thousands of rows of data spread across hundreds of spreadsheets. And it was hard to ask, answer questions like, uh, what, should, what, what uh, should this field contain? So right here you're seeing um, object identifier, edit uh, heading to specify type, and nobody ever specified the type. Um, what kind of data, what kind of data type is this? Uh, Excel is kind of notorious for not knowing what exactly to do with barcodes, string, integer, float, I don't know. Um, and then finally, you know, is this controlled vocabulary really a controlled vocabulary? Um, there's any mix and match of a quarter inch that you can do right there. So normally, normalizing those records was technical debt, and we did not want that technical debt to grow. So we looked for something other than Excel as a transfer format. First, we needed something machine actionable. Uh, we needed a machine actionable data format with a schema to be able to QC that metadata at scale. Uh, unfortunately, because uh, we'd grabbed fields from so many standards, we couldn't use any single standards existing schema. So finally, given the freedom slash burden to uh, write our own schema, we wanted to use something that was easy to write and parse. Uh, JSON and JSON schema fitted those needs. So that's a snippet of what the schema looks like. You can see we've actually said how you, what exactly a quarter inch open real audio format name is. Uh, but implementing this idea uh, has come with its own challenges and that's what Genevieve will talk about. Thank you for the intro, Nick. Um, and so now that we know why and how we decided to go with JSON schema, I'm gonna describe how it actually fits into our quality control workflow, which is sort of the last point before the media goes to our repository. Um, so um, JSON files are created for both in-house and vendor produced uh, digital assets, but I mainly handle the vendor project, so I'm gonna focus on that uh, for my part of the talk. Uh, firstly, 
prior to shipping any physical media to vendors, uh, we export a spreadsheet, as Nick mentioned, uh, from our collection management system with some of the basic required metadata, such as um, title, media type, format, uh, barcodes, and unique IDs. And uh, this spreadsheet is given to the vendors who import those records into their own systems, and uh, the rest of the data is created by the vendor's own technicians during the reformatting process. Um, and the vendors go about their business digitizing objects and deliver us bagged digital assets um, complete with JSON sidecar files, which we then validate upon arrival. Uh, so a couple things to note at this point, uh, most of the media prioritized for reformatting in this project has one, not been fully cataloged, and two, has never been played back before by our staff. So we, uh, so inevitably our vendors have encountered a few errors in our metadata that we send them. Uh, furthermore, our schemas and controlled vocabularies were developed using these historic metadata templates um, which had their own idiosyncrasies. So putting JSON into production has required a lot of conversation with our vendors about their own work, uh, namely their ability to identify errors um, and like what, it, like on the fly and change that metadata and uh, their formatting processes and what information can be captured during each step and um, also what the best practices are for dealing with and capturing complex media formats and how that information can be effectively documented without driving everyone bananas. So for example, um, when we send a vendor an object that we've cataloged as say three quarter inch umatic video, um, but they find out that it's actually a digital audio master recorded on umatic videotape, um, a number of things must be updated. Um, so we add new format and characteristics to the schema um, and we discuss any critical preservation processes uh, with our engineers to see, uh, and our vendors to see if um, we need to add anything to the schema in, in terms of the preservation process. And we confirm interoperability of all these changes with any other vendors that we might be dealing with who might also encounter that same media uh, configuration. And finally, we push these changes. Um, it seems simple enough, right? Uh, which brings me to quality control. So we quickly found that a valid metadata file or JSON file doesn't necessarily mean a perfect deliverable. Uh, we still need to cross-check that our JSON files are not lying about the files that they're describing. And to do this, we use a combination of AJV, another JSON schema validator, uh, which catches any files that don't conform to the schema, and another open source tool called MediaConch, which uses media info to check the assets against a policy that's defined by our, by our specifications. Um, if both the media files and the JSON files pass muster, then we're doing really well. Um, and both of these tools are extremely fast. Um, we can check up to 2,000 media files and 4,000 JSON files in five to 10 minutes, which is great. Um, but running into errors means that we do have to do a little bit of digging around in the JSON files or in the media files themselves to see what the problem is. And AJV's error reporting can be a little bit cryptic, um, but the text-based nature of JSON allows us to easily pinpoint common offenders like audio files that have multiple parts. So then there's the issue of auto-populated values. Um, our preservation master files and de derivative files have uh, different, slightly different specifications, and some of the values um, for our JSON files can't be um, very controlled due to the diverse nature of audiovisual media, um, like sound field and format type, just because there's so, different, so many different ones. Um, so while we're, we're able to catch most of the common offenders, um, there's still a lot of room for error um, as some of the vendors use auto-populated values when they're creating records and some of them use uh, metadata or values that are generated from the, extracting metadata from the media itself. Uh, so for example, if a vendor makes thousands of JSON files for our preservation master video assets that list the files as MP4s rather than Matroska uh, by mistake due to a programming error, um, these would still be valid JSON files, but they would be wrong. Uh, so this, this solution is obviously to have a more restrictive schema uh, performing validation based on more specific criteria. Um, and we're not there yet, but hopefully we will be someday. And considering the current limitations of the schema, we try to give vendors the benefit of the doubt when they encounter troublesome media. And in those cases, we're still really grateful for the notes fields. Um, since the schema and our specs are all on GitHub, our decisions about how we describe characteristics 
um, and provenance of our media are documented as we continue to encounter new media in the collections. So moving on to um, lessons learned. Uh, first off, we're very grateful and lucky to have vendors who have been willing and able to implement this. Um, I've found that this, is, this seems to be rare, a rare thing, um, and they've dedicated countless hours to our persnickety requirements. Um, so thank you to all the vendors who may be listening or here. Um, yeah, and I think as Genevieve pointed out, uh, we have a lot better understanding of what our vendors are actually doing. So uh, just doing this process has given us a lot greater control end to end of our digitization work. Um, third, uh, creating this standard for future records has actually let us look at past records and start figuring out ways to normalize that. So we've even done things like take an Excel file and pass it into uh, Python and then be able to spit out conformant JSON files from that while fixing up the metadata en route. Yeah, and also uh, implementation has taken us farther than what existing standards can support. Uh, sometimes we think too far, um, and other times we've discovered things we couldn't find out any other way. Um, so we wouldn't recommend anyone else try to implement our schema because it's kind of wonky, um, but uh, we'd like to see if some of the ideas in our schemas can be combined with other established standards like PP Core or something like that. Uh, so that's it, and these are our uh, links to our GitHub repos where we have our metadata schema and our specifications, and you can ask us questions on Twitter or you can ask right now. Any questions? <laughs> Minutes. Oh. Cool. No questions? Thanks for staying and listening to us. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs>
uh, within our community stepping up to organize Code for Lib every year. It'd be so much more expensive. It wouldn't nearly be as fun, I think, personally. And uh, for volunteers who participated with Code for Lib any way, shape, or form, committee, or on-site volunteer, et cetera, please stand up and let us give you a big round of applause. <laughs> Not just LBC, I know there's more of you. Um, that being said, um, uh, one last announcement. Code for Lib Scholarship folks, um, in about 10 minutes around 1245, please meet at the registration desk to take a photo together. So uh, thanks again to everyone for a wonderful Code for Lib. I wish you safe travels and I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care everyone.